Very good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, we've got apologies this morning from uh, Katie Clark. Uh, and our first item of business this morning is pre-budget scrutiny of the Scottish Government's forthcoming budget for 2022 to, I beg your pardon, 2023 to 2024. And I refer members to papers one and two. And we'll hear this morning from two panels of witnesses. So can I welcome um, our first panel to the meeting, Mr Eric McQueen, Chief Executive of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, uh, and Mr John Logue, Interim Crown Agent with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. So uh, a warm welcome to you both. Um, so we'll just move straight to questions, uh, if we may, and I'll uh, kick off really just with a, a very general opening question. And um, perhaps I'll come to you first, uh, Mr. McQueen, and then uh, Mr. Logue. Um, so before we sort of get into kind of more detailed questioning uh, around the sort of specific uh, implications of the uh, indicative flat cash settlement, I'm just really, really interested in your initial reaction to the Scottish Government's proposal uh, that there may be a, a flat cash uh, resource settlement uh, for the next few financial years. So maybe come to you first, Mr McQueen. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the flat cash settlement from our, from our point is, is not really a viable position um, in terms of how we operate the courts. We've got serious concerns that it's not just about efficiencies, which have been a, a big part of our business over the last number of years, but by going down to the flat cash route, then this would cut into our core service delivery and it would seriously, seriously jeopardise where we want to go in terms of, of reform. Um, I do want to say that you know, during the pandemic, the funding from Scottish Government has been first class. Um, so we've been incredibly well supported through loss of income of about £15 million, digital investment of about £10 million and COVID planning of about £5 million. Um, we've had a good level of funding again this year, which has helped us through some of the challenges of pay, particularly with the, the cost of living and increased funding just to help us put a, a pay deal in place. So up until now, the funding has been very, very positive and particularly the funding that's in place for the court recovery programme, the overall package of £50 million, which is included within the resource spending view for future years, which again is, is something which gives us some comfort. The, the fundamental issue is that where we're going with the cost of living and inflation, we see potential gaps of about £30 million over the four-year period. And that £30 million would be nigh on impossible to realise without us impact and on core service delivery. It's primarily because of the inflation impact, where we would see a, an annual inflation increase of about £3 million. Um, part of that inflation on services, but also the increased energy costs, but particularly around about the expectation on future pay settlements. Um, so uh, what we've tried to set out in the submission is, is the areas where we think it would most impact, but also trying to say, well, actually, I think there's real opportunities for how we could actually provide a more effective service with the continued investment. So some of the ideas that are around about the forum, particularly in relation to weighted on review of sexual offences, the, the work that's now been undertaken in terms of the summary case management pilot, and um, other areas we're looking at round about virtual custodies, the, the potential of a different way of dealing with domestic abuse cases, are, are all ways that will provide not just a more effective service and hopefully a more efficient service, but actually a better system for compliance for, for witnesses and for accused we take part in it. So we're keen to make sure that this is not a, an opportunity that is lost and set us back. Obviously, the court recovery programme has been a, a major part of our work over the course of the last 18 months. And as we reported, I think, just last week, we've taken 10,000 cases off the backlog in the space of the first year of the recovery programme. We, we now want to extend that programme to the next stage where with summary business now largely coming back on to track and we expect we'll be back there by March 24, we want to move and expand the programme now in, and add further courts into the solemn business, both in the High Court and Sheriff and Jury. Um, that will be challenging for the system as a whole. It's not just about capacity. Um, it's very much about people and that staff, judiciary, the legal profession and, and the Crown Joint <coughs> staff. 
um, because essentially they, they will be significant strain. So we are pretty much now pushing to a place where we're at a, a maximum capacity level. But I think it's something if we go into with our eyes open, if we keep it under regular review, if we listen to the feedback, I think we can get through it. And it will make sure that we recover the solemn programme back to a more acceptable level by March 2025 for the High Court and March 2026 for Sheriff and Jury. Um, those areas are within the spending review, which is positive. Um, but equally, if our core budget is being reduced, then it compromises our ability to deliver on that programme. So, you know, we're having these discussions today um, in terms of a spending review that's produced some what, four or five months now. At the same time, we're having discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Scottish Government officials about the type of funding we will require for future years. So, in a sense, it's, it's almost like two slightly different discussions that are taking place. Um, my hope and expectation is that we don't end up in the flat cash situation. Um, that we do find a way of, of putting in place a, an affordable budget that allows us to carry on with recovery and also carry on with the transformation that we all want to see across justice. Thank, thanks very much, Mr McQueen. And I'll just move straight to you, Mr Logue. Thank you, thank you Convener. Um, I think the best way I can answer that question, I think, is to recognise how we have come to this point uh, in the fiscal service. And that starts with a number of years of what was recognised by the Scottish Government as significant um, underfunding in our, in our budget allocations. And within the last few years, that has been addressed and that has been done by working with the government to be transparent and share with them detailed evidence about what the challenges were, our commitment to reform, our ability to make savings where we could do so. And the committee will obviously be aware, members of the committee will be aware that the consequence of that is that the um, budget for the fiscal service increased from just under £110 million a few years ago to this year, uh, a budget of £175 million approximately. So our, our position in terms of considering the RSR is to start from that point, to recognise the achievements, the things that we've been able to do with that increased investment, and I'd be happy to talk in more detail about those this morning, and to affirm that our ambition is to keep going with that work because we don't pretend for a moment that we have that the job is done in relation to that increased investment. There are still things that we want to do, there are still things that need to improve, um, and it's important that we recognise that. And so we need to continue in that direction. And so our, our position in relation to flat cash in the RSR would be that without the continued investment and the recognition by the government of, of the breadth, the detail and the, the importance of the work that the Fiscal Service does, that the progress that has been made in the last few years would, um, would be at risk and we would not be able to fulfil that ambition to keep going. In general terms, the, the consequences for the system as a whole rather than for the Fiscal Service as an organisation, I think would be that um, the system would be slower than anyone would like it to be. Our ambition is to keep through reform trying to improve the way in which the system operates, but flat cash undoubtedly would result in the system being slower. It would be a system that would not be as informed about trauma and the impact of trauma as we would like it to be, and it would be a system, I think, that would not have be able to focus on the victim and, and provide the services that, that victims need. In, in the way that we would like to do. So those are the things in very general terms, and I'd be very happy to discuss them in any more in more detail this morning. Mm -hmm. th th thanks very much indeed, Mr Logue. So I'm just going to move um, straight over to members now, and I'm going to bring in Colette Stevenson, followed by Jamie Green. Colette. Thanks, convener, and, and good morning. Um, in a similar vein um, to what you were discussing, the predicted shortfall in funding for the Crown Office out to 26, 27, places obviously a significant pressure on meeting your key objectives, um, and, and such as the five-year commitment to clear the COVID backlog, delivery of your staff pay parity award, and delivery of the work of the COVID deaths investigation team. How difficult will it be to deliver these commitments? It would be very difficult because a number of the things that you've mentioned are things that have been specifically recognised as requiring additional funding. So, for example, the Scottish Government has provided funding for additional staff to uh, deal, from our perspective as the prosecutors, with, the, with the, the additional courts required to clear the backlog. So that is something that specific funding has been provided for. Specific funding has been provided for uh, the establishment and, and expansion of our COVID death investigation team. 
and specific funding has been provided for the three-year pay bar parity deal, which was negotiated with the unions, and we're in year two of that, so there is another year of that to go. Um, those are all things that's very specific lines of funding were identified and provided for, and in the absence of that funding, um, then it becomes very difficult, and I think that's part of the, the recognition that the government provided in, in responding to our business case for each of those items, that these things required additional funding. Okay, thank you. I, um, uh, would Eric like to comment on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we tried to set out in our, our, our submission, that if we ended up in, if we did end up in a position where we had a flat cash budget, and particularly if that's what was projected over a, a sort of four-year period, then we would have to plan on the basis that we were going to have a, a funding shortfall of somewhere in the region of £30 million. And quite clear, if that's where you want to be over a, a four-year period, then there's different steps you might take there rather than just trying to deal with a, a, a particular end-year deficit. Um, our, our problem is that the vast majority of our funding is, is actually already pre-committed. Um, so over 70% of our funding is about staff and buildings. Um, other parts of funding are dependent on specific court requirements. So there's very little areas of our funding where we've got flexibility to, to turn things down or, or to release further savings. So without starting to eat into the court programme, uh, without reducing the court programme, as we indicated that potentially reducing summary in, in civil business by up to 25%, cutting back on the, the £3 million that goes into the budget to pay for part-time judiciary, and looking at the very unpalatable option of, of reducing staff numbers. The, these are the very hard things that we would be faced to consider. Um, these are not things that we are planning for at the moment. Um, our working assumption is that we will work through the budget considerations with the Scottish Government and we will achieve a settlement somehow that is, um, that is both affordable and sustainable in terms of our business. But these are the sort of very difficult issues that we would have to consider. Um, our primary rationale would be to try to protect, as far as we could, the most serious cases. Um, so trying to protect the jury business and the, the sheriff courts and the high court. Um, but we would have to look very seriously at what resources we could then devote to areas such as um, summary criminal business, civil business, tribunal business, um, and just accept that there would have to be extended delays, which would have a, a significant impact. I mean, you know, 95% of domestic abuse cases are prosecuted in the sheriff's courts. Um, extending timescales, reducing the support that was going to be available would have a significant impact um, on a large number of complainers and witnesses across the country, so it's not somewhere remotely we would want to go, but being realistic, given the fact that we don't have flexibility within the budget, then actually eating into areas of core business um, are some of the only options that would be available to us. Okay, thank you. Okay, no thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Jamie, I'll bring you in now. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to start with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, just following on from what you've just said. Um, reading your evidence paper to us, you go into some detail on some of the scenario planning that you are doing at the moment on a flat cash settlement. I wonder if you might elaborate on some of those uh, potential scenarios, particularly looking at uh, the reduction in uh, sheriff court sittings by 25%, sounds like quite a lot, uh, reduction in tribunals of 10%, um, and a closure of potentially three or four court buildings themselves. Um, I'm quite concerned about the effect that may have on the backlog, which we already know is, is immense. Could you talk me through what the implications of those reductions would mean to the backlog? Yeah, I, I, what I would say is that I'm, I'm equally concerned, um, and, and probably more so concerned if those were things that actually came to reality. Um, I say what we've had to do is to look at our business in terms of the areas where it, it would have the least impact, um, but any least impact is still a significant impact. Um, so by reducing the, say for example, the summary criminal court programme by 25%, it would allow us to release staff that we put into there. Um, it would allow us to reduce judiciary, not in terms of permanent judiciary, but part-time judiciary we bring in, um, somewhere in the region of about £3 million a year. But effectively what that would do is it would extend quite significantly the timescale for cases. Um, we reckon that it would add to the existing trial backlog somewhere in the region of about 4,000 cases per year. 
um, and we reckon that in a, a very short period of time, probably over the space of about three years, it would return us to the level of the backlog we were at the, pre, at the, pre, at the start of the pandemic. So it, essentially it would be a reversal of all the good work that has gone in um, over the course of the last two or three years. So I say it's not a scenario we are pl actively planning for, um, but it is something we're setting out as being the options it would need to be considered. Um, similarly, because our, our budgets are so tight and constrained, um, one option might be to look at court buildings. Now, we carried out a, a major review some eight or ten years ago of the court estate, and we've got in place what we believe is a court estate that's now fit for purpose for the 21st century. There's no evidence to suggest that we should change from the court estate we have at the moment, but if we were truly in a position um, where we had to find efficiencies in the region of £30 million, then we may have to revisit some of that and change some of the assumptions. We may need to come back to Parliament um, to ask Parliament's agreement to close court buildings. I say it's not something that's part of our planning. We're not actively working up scenarios. We've not identified courts. But that's the sort of thing we would need to start looking at. The, the really important thing about all of these things, uh, these, even if these were going to be taken forward, they are relatively long-term. Um, so these are not savings that you could just turn around in the space of a, a few months and simply realise savings. Going down a restructuring of the court estate, a reconfiguration of staff would take a significant time to achieve. So even achieving the £10 million savings or, or gap that's anticipated in the first year, I've got to say today I'm not sure how we could achieve that within one year. Just to clarify, so at the moment the, the expectation is that the backlog of court cases will return to normal levels by, what, 2025, 2026? Yeah, so for summary criminal business at the moment, our, our projections are that it will return back to the pre-pandemic levels by March 20, 2024. In some cases, some courts, we think that will be a little bit earlier. So that's one area where we have made really good progress. The bulk of the 10,000 cases that have came off the backlog have been largely in relation to, to summary business. So at the moment, that, that's heading, and we're very comfortable that we will be at that point in, in March 2024. The, the solemn business, both in the Sheriff Court and the High Court, is more challenging. Um, business levels have been increasing. Um, so in the High Court, we used to have an average of about 85 indictments coming through a month. The expectation is that will now go up to 100. And I think last month was the first time it hit 100. Um, and in the, the Sheriff Solemn, we normally had about 450 indictments per month. Um, that's going to increase to around about 600 and probably for a three-year period. Mm. So the level of business in the most serious nature of crime is now being reflected within the courts. So our plan now is to move the resources from the summary programme and add that into the solvent programme. So effectively, we will be increasing the capacity in the High Court by around about 40% from pre-pandemic and in the, the Sheriff Court Solemn by around about 50%. So really maxing out the capacity that's available to make sure that within the High Court we can return it to a, a reasonable baseline level by March 2025 and in Sheriff and Jury cases return it to that baseline in March 2026. That's on the current funding scenario, but on a, that, flat, that, on a that, flat cash settlement, that would be, what, 2026, 2027, 20, 28? On, 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 on the flat cash settlement, the, the, there's two things it would depend on. So one, there's a flash cash settlement, but also within the, the resource spending review, there's a commitment to continue with the £50 million funding for the recovery programme. If that was the case, we would still prioritise the resource towards the Sheriff and Jury and High Court to make sure we maintain that programme as far as possible. The area which would see the biggest impact would be some of the criminal business where what we would see is an escalation in terms of the outstanding trials, potentially taking us back to where we were at the start of the pandemic. So we, we would look to maximise the priorities in the, the solemn business while taking the risk on the summary business and essentially allowing timescales um, and, and, and trials to the increase. I'll come back in later. OK, thanks very much. I think, Pauline McNeill, you'd like to come in and then I'll bring in Russell Finlay. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, whichever way you look at it is extremely bleak, which is what I think you're telling the committee, and that's clear in the paper. Um, I mean, I see that... So the closure of three or four courts, if it came to it, still only going to save about four million. Absolutely. And even even in a realistic, the, 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 sort of the best scenario, if you like, 22 million by 26, 27, 
shutting courts is not really going to take you that far. I, I, absolutely, and, and I think that's the point we're making in the submission, that there is a there is a limit on how far we can go to deliver these savings. So even by taking some of the, um, the, the very unpalatable measures, it would only take us a certain distance. Um, mm -hmm. So there are, there, we, we don't have a set of savings on the table at the moment that would deliver £30 million by the end of four years. Um, it would take quite a, a seismic change in our structure and our estate to try to deliver that. And I say that's why we're, that's why we're trying to look at this through a different lens of, of where's the real possibilities of what can be achieved. Um, so there's two major things that have come along. One, the Lady Dorian's review of sexual offending, which could quite dramatically change the way that sexual offences cases are dealt with. But really importantly, the work that I know John's been heavily involved in leading is the summary case management pilot, where fundamentally this is about trying to address the significant churn that exists within the system. So we are still in the position where in the last year there was something in the region of about 33,000 guilty pleas in terms of summary cases, which resulted in intermediate diets being set, trials being set, witnesses being set, for only 5,000 trials to proceed. So there's 31,000 cases which have caused an enormous amount of work um, where eventually the case actually pled guilty. So the whole point of the summary case management pilot is to identify how we can exchange information and disclosure at a very early stage, how we can have active case management and make sure that cases are only being set or trials are only being set for cases that need to be resolved. So there's a, a tremendous amount of work going on at the moment to actually drive out efficiencies and we need to make sure in mm -hmm. terms of the budget settlement that we don't end up in a position where we can't take forward some of the things that are going to have real long-term benefit. Now, th th this could quite have enormous savings. But on an annual basis, there's something in the region of about 400,000 witnesses cited for cases. Very few of those actually end up giving evidence. Only one in ten police officers cited to give evidence in a summary trial is required to give evidence. So there's, a, there's an enormous scope here to make real savings and change quite significantly the whole system costs in terms of the way that summary case management is, is managed. I say that's why we're we're keen that we keep a very strong focus on the good things we can do to change and reform the system and try to avoid getting up in a position where it's just simply about budget cutting and doing things which are not in the interest of the system or of the interest in justice, like closing courts or like reducing court sitting days or cutting staff. That, that's not where we want to end up. So would it be fair to say, based on what you've said, that quite often when you make reforms, you need to spend money at the beginning in order to save money at the end. Would it be your position that that's something that the government should consider? I know there's the 50 million for recovery, yeah. but even at funding the reforms at the beginning, even if the savings, you could demonstrate that savings could come, you know, towards 26, 27, would that be fair? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's, that's the whole premise of our approach and discussion with the government at the moment, is that you're... Let's try to avoid getting just simply some sammy slicing of budgets, but getting into a position where we're making investment in things which will make a tangible difference. And I say not just for the, the efficiency of the system, but for the benefit of all the participants within mm -hmm. the court system. And um, the, the summary case management pilot, I think, is, a, is an excellent example of that. So I wanted to ask you about, you said, for example, reforms around the Lady Doreen review, single judges, etc. And there's a number of innovations that you've, you've mentioned. What can you say to the committee about... So my concern around that would be that particular proposal was in order to try and reduce the delay and recover. Yep. That's Lord Advocate's position. Um, so many women and children are waiting um, as victims to cases that be heard in court. So that would allow to make some progress. But, but how as a committee could we judge whether or not the decision to reform reforms such as that wasn't simply being done for financial savings. Yeah. And um, you, see, you see where I'm coming from here. It's, it's all very well you know, innovating the system to make it more efficient. But I would be deeply concerned if we were making reforms just to save money that wasn't you know, in the interests of justice. And, yeah, and that's I, I, kind of can where... I, say, I, I would mm -hmm. exactly share those exact same concerns. Um, and I don't mm -hmm. think that's the... That's the intention at all. So the way they do on review of sexual offending was not 
at all to do with financial constraints, but it was about changing the whole experience for complainers and, and victims in, in rape and sexual offence cases. Um, and, and that's been the whole drive behind it. I think the byproduct, if we end up with a system that's more efficient and more effective, then there's a benefit in terms of the overall funding situation. But that, as you say, shouldn't be a driver. The driver is exactly the driver that Lady Dorian set out at the start of reviews. And similarly, in terms of the summary case management pilot, the driver here is not about saving money. The driver here is about efficiency and effectiveness of the system, making sure that we make the best use of resources available to us. We limit the number of cases that get set for trial to those that genuinely need a trial to resolve them. We limit the impact on site and a vast amount of civilian and police witnesses. We will never be required to give evidence to court. So this is, again, the byproduct is it may be more effective and it may be cheaper to operate but the fundamental thing is actually about improving the efficiency of the system it's about reducing time scales for cases to be settled and making sure we can use the most expensive resources to deal with the cases that genuinely do need a trial in a much shorter time frame so i'm absolutely on all fours we shouldn't be doing things just simply because it's driving efficiency we should be doing things that are improving the system while the byproduct is it's a more effective and efficient way of operating thank you very much Thanks. And, and I think there some members have some more questions specifically about the Lady Dorian review um, later on. But uh, just on the back of uh, Jamie's earlier question, I'm going to bring in uh, Russell Finlay and then I think Fulton McGregor you'd like to yeah, pick up as well. On, uh, Paul McNeil's question, but I think it was actually partly covered there, but I would still like to ask it then, but I can come in. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in the letter from the court service, I see there's projections around the set proposed settlement um, with a realistic funding gap totalling about 60 million over four years, with a pessimistic um, projection of over 81 million. And we know that inflation is running both in Scotland and the EU and the US at around 9-10%. So hopefully this will not come to pass. And will be more like the optimistic projection rather than these two other scenarios. Yeah, just just to clarify, those those, those are not individual years, but that's a cumulative effect. But yes, that's the four-year yeah. total. Yeah, so so, uh -huh. so the 30 million is the total of the, the four years. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. yep, indeed. Um, now, given the financial pressures, even the most optimistic projection, and given the backlog that already exists, has there been any discussion between the court service and the Crown about dealing with the summary cases more efficiently in terms of non-court disposals, which is a direction of travel in the justice system anyway, but specifically in light of the budget pressures, has that been talked about? And I suppose yeah. both of you could, could answer that. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's, it's something that we've put in the submission, something that, that, that's certainly worthy of looking at. Um, so are there more opportunities for diversion initially from even from police so in terms of initial report and other opportunities for the police to divert cases without going through prosecution and in terms of alternative courts are there options in terms of different work orders or fiscal fines that could be considered quite clearly during the the pandemic the opportunities for these were much more limited um, but I think it's certainly something that's that's fair to consider. I think, and, and John can speak from the Crown's perspective, I think part of the issue is there has been probably a, a quite significant reduction in the types of cases at the very lowest level that normally would have attracted these types of disposals. Um, there does seem to be, a, while there's less cases coming through the summary side, they do seem to be of a, a more serious nature. And I'd say the, the biggest predominant factor in terms of summary business presumably um, drug is, 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 is domestic abuse. Yeah. Is no longer John, I think it's, it's probably more apt for you to answer that one. Thank you. Um, I think, Mr Finlay, the, the, the way I would answer that question is to provide the committee with reassurance, and I think you should have had this from correspondence throughout the, the course of the pandemic, that the change in the emergency legislation, which in, introduced a higher rate of fiscal fine, um, has been used proportionately in a relatively small number of cases. And I think the committee received regular updates in relation to the data that's, that, that demonstrates the way in which those increased powers have been used by prosecutors. Um, I think it would be wrong if, to um, imagine that the answer to the backlog 
is to suddenly transfer cases out of court that should be in court and they're there because it's right that they're in court. It would be wrong as prosecutors to start doing different things with those cases just because there is a backlog. There are other ways in which we are working very hard to, to address the backlog. But I, I, I think with the exception of the additional powers which Parliament gave to prosecutors in relation to fiscal fines, the changes that the committee could see in relation to the use of direct measures by prosecutors are driven primarily by changes in the nature of offending and reporting of cases by the police to, so, to, to so, procure I mean, the basis fiscal. of that answer, it sounds like there's not really an active discussion about you know, a change of policy or at, such like. At no, point, no. at no point during the pandemic have have we as prosecutors sought to put forward a position that the answer to the backlog is, is to take cases out of court that should be in court and do something else yeah. with them? And I think, I think the Lord Advocate actually gave an assurance to the committee this time last year that um, there, is, there is no proposal on the part of prosecutors to, to take no action in cases as a result of, of the pandemic. Cases will continue to be dealt with in the way that we judge to be right according to the public interest. Sure. Come back to the focus on summary cases. You, you've spoken already, Mr McQueen, about one in ten police officers cited for summary cases don't give evidence. It's a monumental waste of their time. It takes them away from communities at a time when police budgets are, as we heard last week, under extraordinary pressure. Um, use the word churn. This has been a blight in the justice system, in the court system, for years. And uh, with tens of thousands of summary cases where work is done and then a guilty plea is ultimately reached and all that work has not been needed. Why on earth has there not been a sort of better grip on this until now? What can be done? It, is it a question of too many organisations all blaming one another? Does the blame lie with the Crown, with the courts, with the judiciary, with defence lawyers? And, and why are these figures so appalling and these delays so built into the system? What can really be done apart from continually recognising it and talking about it? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a case of, of blame. Um, I think it's a case of that's how, they, that's how the system's evolved over the years. But I think what there is now is a real concerted effort to, jo to, to address this. Um, so there is now a project board that's been in place that's chaired by Sheriff Principal. Um, it now involves the Crown, the police, SCTS and the legal profession. Um, there's now three pilots up and running in Paisley and Hamilton and Dundee, where the whole e emphasis is about much earlier disclosure, about actually trying to case manage and drive these cases out at a very early stage. The, the very early results, just based on the first few months of the pilot, are showing quite a positive income in terms of increased guilty pleas coming through in all of those courts by increasing the first month of between 8 and 13 percentage points. Um, John sits on the, the project board for it. Um, John, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about some of the early progress we're starting to see. Yes, very, very happy to expand on Eric's answer. The, I think the answer to your question, Mr Finlay, is that um, there have been attempts for a number of years in the justice system to, to deal with the very issues you're talking about. This is not something that's been ignored by any means. The issues you've described have been properly recognised and, and action has been taken. Things that have helped with that in recent years um, have been um, better use of digital technology, and I'll say a little bit about that in relation to the particular pilot courts in, in a moment. But I think it's also fair to recognise that the pilots which started in September of this year um, are actually an update and a modification of a reform which started in January of 2020. And you don't need me to explain to you in any detail why that had to come to a sudden stop in February of 2020. So, but the time during the, the, the pandemic was not wasted. And that was the point at which I became involved in the project. And Eric is right to indicate that one of the significant changes this time is that the project has led by the judiciary. And I think that's made a very significant difference to this because I think um, not only does it give the judiciary a role in relation to the shaping of the reforms and how they're to be implemented, I think it also, going back to Pauline McNeill's question, I think should give the committee confidence that these are not reforms 
designed to save money. The, I, the, I am confident the judiciary in Scotland would not be interested in reforms to save money. They are interested, um, as the law officers are, um, in reforms which make the system work better. And these pilots undoubtedly are indicating, even after only now two months, September and October, very, very encouraging signs of progress. And so, for example, in relation to the number of police witnesses cited, which I think was one of the issues of concern you highlighted, Mr Finlay, um, in one of the pilot courts, the number of police witnesses that we as prosecutors had to cite to come to give evidence in trial dropped by 50 per cent in one month. Now, my challenge, I think, to the justice system as a whole is to imagine that type of benefit scaled up in every court across the country every month of the year. This is a pilot, a, a reform, which offers, I think, one of the most significant opportunities for really improving the way in which the courts work, in, in my experience of almost 29 years as a procurator fiscal. And the, I think it's right, even though they're not represented today, Day, but you heard from Police Scotland last week, I think it's right, I think, to pay tribute to the role of the police in those reforms, because the way in which this reform is being introduced, and again, I'm going back to a point that Pauline McNeill was making, this particular reform is not one that is being driven by increased investment by the government. This is not a reform that requires additional money to be spent. This is something about changing the way the courts work and the people within the courts work. That's about doing things differently. So from the point of view of the fiscal service, we have not received any additional funding to make this reform work. We are finding ways of reallocating our, our attention and our people in order to make this happen. But Police Scotland have also done the same. And coming back to the point I made earlier about digital improvements and one of the reasons why these reforms, as time progresses, become um, more powerful, is Police Scotland have been able to put in place new ways of working with us as prosecutors. And they are giving prosecutors at the same time as they give us the report, they are now giving us key evidence in the case. And for a domestic abuse custody case, that could, for example, include the statement of the victim, perhaps photographs of, of any injuries that the victim had suffered, of, of the, the, the place where the assault took place, um, any video evidence that the police have secured at an early opportunity. We're now getting that on the morning of the custody case with with the report from the police. Now, those of you who have experience and an understanding of the criminal justice system will know instantly what a difference that makes to have that. That's being done digitally. That wasn't available in January 2020. It certainly wasn't available before that. So it's, a, it's, it, it's an interesting example of why I think uh, time has not been wasted, but we have been able to take advantage of, of <laughs> unexpected developments and interruptions, use that time well, and take advantage of other um, opportunities. That, that come through better use of digital technology. The consequence of that is, in September, we received just over 300 pieces of digital evidence from the police through a digital secure website. Now, that previously would have been evidence the police would have to have burned onto a disk or onto a pen drive. That's 300 pen drives and disks that have to be moved around. They have to be brought to us. We don't get them at the time of the report. We don't have them for the case calling in court. We then have to copy them. We have to then hand over these things to the defence. That's all gone yeah. in these pilots. That potential is hugely significant and becomes an important part of, of um, how not only we can improve the system, but actually we can demonstrate to, to you and to the government and to the public that actually it is still possible despite the wider difficulties at the moment, to make real improvements in the way that the courts work. And finally, um, going back to the point that Pauline McNeill made about how, how do you demonstrate, how do you as a committee have confidence it's working? I think, I think you can have confidence not only from that early reduction in the number of police officers being cited, but more cases being resolved at the beginning. That's fewer cases having to be prepared for trial, fewer witnesses being cited. That's a, an immediate outcome within days or weeks of the case starting, that has to be better for the victim, it has to be better for the accused themselves and the court when they're, when they're sentencing the accused, to be able to do that at a point that is, is proximate to the offence having taken place um, must be a more effective way of dealing with it. So all of that is an attempt, I think, to answer your question that yeah, sure. it's, this is not something that's been ignored 
It's not something that's been left. A lot of work has been done. It started in September, and I think the potential is enormous. Yeah, I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing the statistics around the pilots and seeing how it works out. Um, just very quickly, coming back to the point I think Pauline raised about the 7,000 COVID deaths being subject to investigation. Now, there's a unit that's been set up to deal with that. It's not presumably the same as a full FAI for each death. Um, is that correct? And if so, is there any sort of public outcome in relation to these deaths? The, the work of the, the unit, which is still being um, set up to the, uh, and by what, what I mean by that is it's being expanded. It, the, the Scottish Government provided additional funding in the current year um, of about two million pounds to allow us to expand it to the, the point where we feel confident that it will be of the, of the right size to deal with the scale of the increased reporting of deaths. That team will, um, as we would with any other death investigation, the conclusion of the investigation could result in one of a number of outcomes, one of which may be that there is no further investigation required and the, the, the role of the team and the, the investigators is then to communicate that to the, uh, the nearest relatives of the deceased. It may be that there, that there could be a fatal accident inquiry and again there would be communication with the nearest relatives and interested parties in relation to the fatal accident inquiry. We will ensure that there is transparency in relation to the, the work of that team um, over the coming two years. We indicated to the government that we thought the work of this team would carry into the next financial year, 23-24, and, uh, and the following year. The funding has been provided for this year, and it remains part of the budget discussions for next year for us to have that discussion with the government about the need for that, that work to continue. To give you an idea of the scale of the work, um, we are aiming to build a team that will have between 90 and 100 members of staff in it. Um, not all of them are... are lawyers, but many of them are, and we, the Lord Advocate has appointed two senior counsel to provide direction to some of the more complex investigations which are being carried out. So I, I think your question about the outcomes being public, we will, insofar as we can respect, the, the, obviously, the privacy of individuals and families, we will be transparent about the, the work that that team does. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Just. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, before we move on to um, other areas of questioning, I wonder if I can just stay with you, Mr Logue, and just pick up on a point that um, Mr McQueen made earlier uh, in relation to the bulk of budget being um, taken up with staff costs. And um, I assume that that's a similar position in uh, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal. Uh, and I suppose I'm interested in what the kind of options or scenarios um, might be that you're looking at going forward in terms of budget, um, however sort of difficult they may be, and whether there are implications in maintaining um, staff costs um, but having to adjust uh, things like perhaps recruitment, um, pay freeze, that type of scenario. So I'm just interested to bring you in on that particular question. Yes, thank you. Um, the position is very similar for the fiscal service as it is to the court service. Um, I think the latest figure is that about 76 to 77 per cent of our budget is spent on the staff that we have. Now, I think it's important, linking into the point I made at the beginning, to recognise that our staffing complement has grown from somewhere just under 1,600 members of staff to, I think, in April of this year, 2,200 members of staff. These are full-time equivalents. That's a very simple demonstration of the, of the consequence of the investment that's required a lot of recruitment effort on our part, a lot of training and investment, um, bringing people into the organisation and equipping them. Um, the remaining 23 to 24 per cent of our budget is taken up with um, the costs of providing forensic pathology and toxicology, the cost of running our estates. They're roughly 5 to 6 per cent each of our budget. Those are the two largest non-staffing expenditure items. And beyond that, you are then looking at contractual spend, for example, in relation to all of the costs that go with running an organisation spread around the entire country, mm -hmm. plus the costs of, of operating our, our operational casework, the, the cost for witnesses and the cost of preparing and investigating cases. It will be obvious, I think, from that, that if we find ourselves in a situation where our budget does not allow us 
continue operating in the way that we have been for the last two or three years, the only control that we have over our costs is to, to reduce our, our recruitment. And that, as, as a consequence of there being no compulsory redundancies, means that you are responding to staff who choose to leave for a number of different reasons, and they, they don't all leave from one place or at one time, and so you end up with gaps opening up in different places. It's a very, very poor way to, to, to respond to a change in, your, in your, the shape of your workforce. You're not doing it in a planned way, in the way that we've been able to plan our, our, our increase. And so that, that inability to recruit would be the most significant um, implication, I think, of, of a funding level that doesn't meet the, the very particular needs that we've discussed. So what, just picking that point up then, what would be potentially the impact of that recruitment freeze? In what sense do you mean impact? I suppose on service delivery, essentially. So if, if the consequence of that is we, we can't change the work we deal with. Mm -hmm. if, if we have fewer staff, that means fewer staff having to handle the work that previously was dealt with by a larger group of people. That has, I think, obvious consequences in terms of the speed with which cases can be progressed, the speed with which investigations can be carried out. Um, Frankly, it would inhibit us and prevent us probably from doing the sort of things that we would like to be able to do in the next few years around expanding our contact with, with victims. One of the, as an example of that, I know we've spent quite a bit of time this morning talking about the summary case management pilots in the three courts, but one of, one of the reforms we have introduced in addition to that is prosecutors in each of those courts are now calling by telephone the victim in every domestic abuse case that calls in court within two weeks of the case calling. And that's to build on and supplement the contact that our VIA staff provide. So now in those three courts, because, and, and this is an example of us having to, in a sense, reallocate our resource and front load at this stage, but we hope that the benefits will mean that we can do this in many, many more cases. But prosecutors are now able to have a conversation with the victim in the domestic abuse case at a very early stage of the case, introduce themselves, explain what's happening, give them an indication of what to expect. And sometimes that has turned into an opportunity to, to gather more evidence and information that's been helpful to the case. That's a very clear example of how we think we can continue to improve having fewer staff, potentially an increasing workload, as it has been for a number of years, if that continues. I think the committee can well understand that, that we, we just will not be able to, to provide that, that service in the way that we hope to. Yep. That, that, thanks very much. OK, I'm going to bring in uh, Rona Mackay now, and then um, I'll bring in Pauline McNeill uh, after Rona. Thank you. Convener, good, good morning. Um, can I come first to um, Mr Logue, please? Um, it's just a couple of um, things I wanted to ask you. Um, first of all, good news on the success of the pilots that you were describing and how um, you know how that's helped a lot, etc. If I'm understanding what you said correctly, um, you said that a lot of the things that, that have happened did not require the extra funding and were would seem to me like they were operational um, uh, matters that have, have been successful. So I'm struggling to understand why they would be compromised in that sense. That's kind of my first question. Sorry if it's naive, but I just want you to clarify that. Um, also, um, in your earlier statement, you, you talked about um, things still needing to improve, and I think you've, you've, you've probably covered that and what you've been saying to my colleague um, Russell. But you did say that, and one of that would be um, that your practitioners would not be informed by trauma. And again, I'm struggling to understand why that would be the case if, if your, your current staff have had trauma training and, and, and what are the, how would that Im, implicate on, on trauma? If, if uh, is that for training or incoming staff? Is that is that what you mean? So again, if you could just clarify that, thanks. Yes, yes, no, very happy to do so. So on the first point. Um, Although the reforms in the, in the summary case management pilots haven't required additional funding from the government, it has required us as an organisation to change the things that people do. So, for example, prosecutors who are taking the initial decisions in a report as to whether or not to prosecute, there is now more evidence for them to consider 
they're not just reading a report which contains a summary from the police. They're now having to also read the, the victim's statement, perhaps look at photographs, consider videos. Um, now, all of that is a good thing to do because that produces a better considered decision by the prosecutor at the beginning, and we're all in favour of that. But that's extra time and capacity that has to... For, for that work to be done. So that costs more? That costs more, but that's not something that we went to the government and said we need the funding for that. We were able to redirect resource within the organisation to allow that to be done. The consequence of unwinding the benefits and the, 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 the benefits of the increased investment and that increase in staffing that I talked about is we were able to do that because we had benefited from that increased investment and we had additional staff investigating deaths, investigating uh, sexual offences, communicating with victims. We had extra staff dealing with the recovery courts. And because we had that, we were, that made it possible for us then to redirect resources. So you're saying you'd have to reduce the staff that were involved in that? It, 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 my, my fear would be that if, if the organisation has to, in an uncontrolled way, reduce its size because of reduced funding, it makes it much more difficult to do. Now, the success of these pilots it, it, it is so apparent after the first month we will be doing everything we can to make sure that we can continue delivering that success because I think it's obvious to all of us the potential of what could be achieved. So I'm not offering up the pilots today as an example of something that would have to stop. I'm offering it to you, I think, as an example of how, despite the difficulties that we are facing, and, and it has correctly, I think, in terms of the backlog being described as the professional challenge of our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. But despite that, there still is the potential for reform. There still is the potential, but we have to recognise that takes time and investment and training. Uh, on your second point about trauma, mm -hmm. just to I, I, I perhaps need to clarify where we are as an organisation. A lot of mm -hmm. work has been done within the justice system and is still being done. Mm -hmm. A framework is being developed in relation to trauma and how to understand the impact of trauma and how to respond to trauma mm -hmm. appropriately. We are launching a mandatory training programme for all of our staff that later this month, in the middle of November. Mm -hmm. That's the first stage in a programme of work which we have planned because, again, going back to the increased investment, we have been able to expand our, our training capacity in the organisation. That's one of the things that's benefited from that. So we have this programme in relation to trauma, but that, as you can imagine, requires staff to have the time and the capability um, to themselves become more informed before they can train others, to the time to develop the training plus the operational impact of rolling that training out, all of that has a cost. And I think my general point is that's not a challenge that the fiscal service faces on its own. There's a need for the system as a whole to be better trauma-informed. Yeah. But it seems to me that as a perfectly legitimate ambition for the system to have, it's the sort of thing that becomes much more difficult to do if, if there is uncontrolled uh, reduction in resource ac across different parts of the system. So I hope I've, I've explained why mm -hmm. it makes it more difficult. I hope I've also been able to give you a little bit of an understanding where the fiscal service is on that, okay. that process. It's not an immediate thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. long term. It's, it's a long term. I mean, all, I, I'm, I'm no expert on the matter, but my understanding is this is going to take some time for everyone in the system to be better informed yeah. and to understand how they then respond with the... That, that the knowledge of trauma in relation to an individual. Okay, thank you. If I could ask um, Mr McQueen, just going back really to, to Pauline uh, McNeill's point about the, the key reforms in Lady Dorian's review, I'm, I'm, I'm keen just to um, explore a bit on how that, that would and why that should be impacted um, and to ask you, you know, do you have a separate budget for those reforms and has, it been evaluate, has that been evaluated? And um, did you receive money to implement these reforms? Have you already received that? And are you now saying you couldn't use that money for that? So um, I, I, okay. I know it's yeah. a very basic question. You could maybe yeah, just clarify. I, I, I think it's fair to say that the implementation of Lady Dorian's reforms is, is still in the fairly early stages. Um, so gov Scottish Government are now trying to look at the overall implementation. Um, so there is now an implementation group that's been formed. I think they had their... Their, their initial meetings over the last few months. So what they're trying to do now is to set out the 
the programme of change is now required. Not all of the change requires legislation. Mm -hmm. So there's some parts of the Dorian's reforms which can be taken forward with some, some operational changes. So that's now been looked at. Mm -hmm. um, the aim then is to look at what aspects require the legislation and bringing that then forward mm -hmm. before Parliament. Um, at that stage, they'll be looking at the overall cost and allocating budgets. So budgets haven't yet been allocated okay. for mm -hmm. the implementation of it. So this would be additional funding that would be on top of the budgets that we're already talking about about today. Okay. And would that not be a sort of um, operational priority decision for, for you to make once you get your, your, your it, lump sum? It, it, it would be an, an absolute priority and, and it's certainly one of our one of our top priorities. Our our funding works in the way that part of our funding comes from government. Um, so as part of the budget bill, we get in terms of resource, we get the best part of our 100 million a year comes through as part of our funding. Mm. Um, we also retain civil income, um, a certain amount of criminal fines, which is about another 46 million. A big part of our funding and potentially anywhere in a given year between 20 and perhaps 50 million comes from government in terms of in-year funding. So that's funding to support specific legislative changes, to support reforms. So on top of the budget, there's an, an, an ongoing discussion with government about when additional funding is required for further changes. So, for example, we're in discussion with government at the moment about extending evidence by commission suites across the whole of Scotland. So we've got four main centres now where we have suites in place. We want to expand that so there's evidence by commission suites available in each of the sheriffdoms. So on top of the budget discussions we're having at the moment, we are discussing with government about funding coming through at some stage next year that would allow us to expand that evidence by commission capacity, which is a key part of, of Lady Dorian's review. Mm -hmm. so, so no budgets have been allocated as yeah. yet. Yeah. Um, part of the big change would come when legislation change comes through, mm -hmm. but we are discussing incremental funding yeah. elements come through to take forward mm -hmm. the parts that can be achieved without legislation. Okay. And, and would it be fair to say, and it, it sounds like you know where you, you want to go and what you want to do, um, would it be fair to say then that your concerns lie <coughs> really around, that the budgetary concerns lie around staff? Is that, is, I know that's an overview, but... It's, it, it's st staff and inflation are our, are, are our, two, mm -hmm. our two major worries. Mm -hmm. um, so, so most of the issues in terms of the funding gap are driven by cost of living pay increases for staff mm -hmm. and the concerns about inflation and energy costs. Yeah. So, so these are issues which in, in, in recent years have been funded by government as part of the settlement. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the budget for 22-23, we were given an extra 4.2 million by government, which offset the pay costs and offset the inflation costs. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what we need for the remainder of the period is for that same process to continue, continue. where we're properly funded for inflation and pay. Mm -hmm. And that on top of that, we're properly funded for the reform programmes and the changes that come through, such as Lady Dorian's review. OK, thank you. Thanks, Karina. Thanks very much. Um, I'll <coughs> bring in Pauline McNeill and then I'll bring in Russell Finlay with some more questions. Pauline. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, so I think you've answered all the questions in relation to trying to understand you know, the innovations and reforms, etc. And obviously some required legislative change. Some of those proposals are controversial and may not see the light of day, but anyway, that's for another day. Um, I'll be honest, I'm slightly clutching at straws here when I ask you this question, but it's in my mind. I mean, it seems to me that um, obvious that if the government put a bit more money up front now, then if some of these changes at least can bring savings, even without potential staff reduction or no compulsory redundancies, for example. Is there any modelling being done, for example, on figures? I mean... So let, let's say you said to the government, give us X million in order to, to front load um, some change, but we can deliver savings in future years. Is that kind of discussion ongoing? And the reason I'm asking that question is because our job should be choose to try and suggest something to the government is to say we're concerned about this and therefore we would propose we're required to see where the money would come from. That's the trick in the, in the question that we have to answer. But I just wonder, do, can you provide any modelling around 
like savings in future years? Um, I, I think we can through time and, and probably grasp them with the same straws that you, that, that you were grasping in terms of the, the question. So I think there's quite a lot of work that's been done through the Criminal Justice Board that brings the key organisations together in terms of what that future reform programme looks like, where the benefits are to the system, the rationale between why we'd want to take those forward. I think the stage that we're now trying to get into is is understanding properly what the cost benefits are. So I think this is the whole point you're talking about in terms of modelling. So why would you take forward a certain thing? Fundamentally, you'll take it forward because it's making an improvement to access to justice and delivery justice, but also recognising where are the financial benefits and financial advantages of making investment in one area over another at this particular time. So I say that's part of the thinking now that will be taking place within the Criminal Justice Board to help us look at what that longer term investment is going to be needed from government. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, I'll bring in Russell Finlay now. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've got two separate questions, one for each of you, not connected to one another. The first one is for the court service. Now, in your letter, you refer to the income that's generated in the region of £46.5 million in the current year from civil court business. And you may recall that I wrote to you earlier this year about a court press agency which um, accesses certain information for an annual fee. This was a fairly uh, nominal fee of £350 per annum. Uh, they have been informed that this is rising to £34,000, which is an increase of over 4,000%. Um, you were kind enough to reply and you said that this would be looked at as part of a broader review beginning last month. And I'm just curious as to whether there's been any progress in that front and whether there's been any sort of sympathy given to how extreme and frankly unworkable such an increase would be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can certainly say that, that there's sympathy being given. Um, so certainly we, we, we don't want to be in the position that we are preventing access to information simply because of cost. Um, so that review is underway. Um, and, and as soon as it's completed, we'll, we'll come back to you on it. Great, thank you very much. Um, and for the current office, the Rangers malicious prosecution scandal, um, can you tell us how much now the total bill for compensation is at? Yes, as of yesterday, um, the stage at which the litigation had reached uh, has now reached the point where the costs have increased to just under £51 million. OK. It was reported in the media that it was over £60 million. Is that incorrect? Um, I, I'm, I'm advising you of what, what the cost is. Um, the, the, how the media choose to portray things, I'm afraid, I have no, no control over. But the cost... Or, or it may be there's further costs ex expected or have been agreed to, but the well, money's not going out the door. Or... There's, a, there's a degree of... Um, there's always a degree of speculation about, about such matters, and I recognise that, but uh, I... As I'm afraid the general position is, remains as, as it was explained to you before by the Lord Advocate that you'll understand the ongoing, there is still ongoing litigation um, and therefore that limits what I'm afraid I can say. But as of yesterday, the litigation had reached the stage where uh, I, I, I'm now publicly able to confirm. And, and one very important point of clarity, given the budgetary pressures in the Crown Office, the government's commitment to meet the cost of all comp is it all compensation or is it only up until this point and the rest of it is up for discussion or is it an open ended? So the position remains as confirmed to you last year by the Lord Advocate that the costs associated with the litigation will uh, not be met from the, the, the fiscal service budget. And that includes any additional compensation that may arise from the same matters? I'm not saying there will be more compensation paid, but no. um, my understanding is that uh, there, is, there are none of the limits that, that you were describing in, in terms of that arrangement. So, so therefore it won't impact on Crown budgets in any way? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Uh, I'm now going to bring in Fulton McGregor. Hey, thanks, Convener, and good morning uh, to the panel. Thanks very much for your evidence so far. Um, I had looked to come in as a supplementary earlier on Lady Dorian's work, which, of course, the committee is very interested in and very supportive of, but I think it's been covered, and um, I'm glad, actually, Convener, that you um, didn't bring me in because I'd have been stepping on my colleague, Ronnie McKay's toes. Um, so uh, thanks very much for that, but I just, um, just wanted to clarify that point. Um, I've got two, two broad questions, um, not 
not really related. The first, I was looking for a wee comment on um, if you've got any idea of what you might see as the impact of the revenue raised through fees in civil court cases if the current inflationary cycle continued beyond 2023. What impact do you think that could have um, overall? Um, the potential we could see an increase in civil cases. Um, I mean, normally when there are financial challenges where things are tightened, then it, it, it can tend to increase um, litigation. I think that's been that's been seen in previous times where there was financial crisis. Um, at the moment, we're not seeing this because obviously it's still at the it's still at the very early stages. Um, the civil business at the moment is is probably slightly behind where it was at the pre-pandemic level, um, but equally that has been a continuing trend for for quite a number of years now, and it does seem to have bottomed out at a, a level over the last sort of four or five years. So, yes, I think there is the, the, the potential, um, depending on where the, the financial crisis goes and, and, and how that drives litigation. I guess the question I've got, though, is something that you mentioned earlier um, about that the service would continue to prioritise um, the criminal cases, in particular the most serious, and I think, we, I think everybody would agree with that, you wouldn't have any argument. But it does... The, the sort of um, that it does imply that civil stuff might then take more of a back seat, if if you like, for for want of a better expression. Um, but of course, the civil cases as a revenue stream mm -hmm. for you as well. So that's the stuff that would take the back seat, but that's also a revenue in an already constrained budget. So has that has that been thought how that how that could actually play out? Yeah, I, I see. At the moment, what we've what we put at the table is is the options that we. would we'd have to consider in detail in terms of what the impact would be, how we would take this forward. Um, it's quite clear that you know, if we had to restrict some of the capacity we put the civil business then it would elongate some of the timescales. The timescales in civil business are, 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 are pretty good at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it could be that there could be a an accepted position where some civil cases were going to take slightly longer, but at the same time it's the, the point John was making earlier in relation to, in relation to criminal business, civil business that in criminal business that we are continue to drive change and innovation in the way we're doing civil business. More and more civil business now is moving online. Um, the expectation is that over the course of the next 12 or 18 months, all civil actions raised in Scotland will now be able to be raised online and will be taking paper largely out of the system. Um, there's new case management process coming in to actually improve the system. So we'd We'd actually hope that where we're arriving at the point a civil business is a system that is modernised, that is more efficient, that actually taking some of that capacity out in future years might not impact on the same way that it would do on somebody's criminal business. So it is about the modelling we need to do to look at these two things as a as a whole. Okay, thanks very much for that. The other area I wanted to ask about is something that um, I've asked the other witnesses we've had on in previous panels as well, and that's about how I suppose it's the the, the play between the whole justice sector. Um, obviously we're going to be hearing from the, the prison service a, a, a wee bit later, another key player in that, but do, do you have a, do, when you're taking into account uh, budget um, decisions and, and ideas, um, do, do you take into account some of the stuff that you might have heard from the police and the fire service, for example, last week, um, you might hear later from the prison service about how all that's going into link and how, if they're all getting a, a flat cash yep, settlement, absolutely. how does that impact on yeah, I, I think in, in all honesty, that's the probably the biggest beneficial change that I think we've seen from the pandemic, particularly um, about the, the the interaction, about the collaboration, about the openness. Um, so the Criminal Justice Board got formed in the very early stage of the pandemic that brings together the key the key organisations, and we continually now almost on a fortnightly basis. Um, share the challenges we're being faced, share the impact of reform and innovation, look at it from different perspectives, and fully take into account the impact of different organisations on, on things that we're driving forward. Um, I mean, just a, a really simple example of, of a result of that. Um, we've now put in place a process in the High Court where police and expert witnesses can give their evidence remotely. Now, there's no significant benefit to the courts out of that, but obviously there's a significant benefit to police and expert witnesses. So hearing from the police about their pressures, their constraints on managing off of time, the impact on, on, 
or over time, we've been able to put in place quite a straightforward solution, which has immediately benefited the police. So that's a, a very low level example, but I think it's a good example of the way we are sharing, listening and reflecting on what we can achieve. But equally, I would extend that to the legal profession. Um, I think in the past, our relationship with the legal profession probably wasn't the best, to be quite honest. Um, I think during the pandemic, that has changed quite significantly. So the, the types of things that we have discussed in here are the same discussions now that we have with the faculty and the law society about the impact of the pandemic, about the reform, about how we try to take things forward. It's been key in terms of the discussions about where we go with the recovery programme in the future. Um, really listening to the concerns of the faculty and the, the law society about the available of counsel and solicitors about the impact it has on them. So I think, if anything, that whole collaboration um, has really improved dramatically over the last two or three years and something we absolutely want to hang on to for the future. Yeah, and just as a comment on that, I think that um, you, you referred to it as a low-level uh, change, but I think it's, um, I think it's, a, it's a really good one, because I even remember back to my own days, uh, seven years ago working in criminal justice and social work and been down at um, yeah. courts and police officers were often there the whole Absolutely. day Absolutely. and they would actually say to you and this is the third time in a month they've been doing this so I think that's a, a Absolutely. Really well so it says that started now in the High Court and we want to expand that next year um, into the Sheriff's Court because the, the, the impact of the police although it's a low level change for us the impact for the police is, is enormous, it's enormous. Thanks, okay, thanks very much Okay, I'm going to come back to Jamie Green bring you in now Thank you um, I'd like to bring the conversation back to the budget um, which is the purpose of our evidence session, uh, pre-budget scrutiny. I'd like to refer uh, our witnesses to the papers and evidence given on their forecasting and modelling. I'm going to start with the Crown. Um, in your evidence, you state that the budget resources needed to deliver justice, tackle case backlogs, investigate COVID deaths and maintain pay parity, which I'll come on to in a second, are as follows. Um, the table you've given us uh, I estimate to accumulate £766 million pounds, uh, required to perform those duties. A flat cash, flat cash settlement would deliver £680 million. That's a shortfall of £87 million. Pounds. You then state that that would uh, affect your ability to meet your statutory obligations. Uh, what are your statutory obligations and what will an £87 million pound shortfall actually look like in terms of your ability to deliver services? So I, th I think what you're doing there is providing a cumulative figure across I'm, I'm the quoting years. you the numbers you gave us back. So yes. year one, you'd require £190 million. Year yes. two, £195, yes. 192, £190, yes. and so on and so forth. So yes. that's obviously way above what is on offer in the yes. flat cash. No, no, I'm just being very clear that the figure you're quoting isn't actually in our letter. What you've done is add up a number of years, and that's... It, that's, indeed. that's I understand. It's just so that I understand what it is the, that, that you're saying. Um, our statutory obligations um, are to investigate deaths and to investigate and, and prosecute criminal offences. Um, and what I've tried to do this morning is to give an illustration of the ways in which that would be impacted by um, the flat cash funding. So, looking at the table then, so the way you've presented it is that there's uh, a flat cash settlement of £170 million per year for four years. Over on top of that, you then detail uh, the cost of different functions. Uh, the first one, for example, being the COVID death uh, investigation team, which is on top of the 170. <coughs> so is it safe to assume that if the government, when it comes to budget time, actually presents you more than 170, I guess my question is, in between that 170 and 190, which of those will you be able to deliver and which of those will you not be able to deliver? I refer to page 19 of your... Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so you will understand that obviously the discussions with the government about next year's budget are still to take place and the difficulty I have in answering your question precisely I think is that without knowing if the figure, I think what you're asking is if the figure is between 170 and 190, 189 for next year for example, which choices would we make? That would really depend on the figure. Um, it's very mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. to, um, to, to pick and choose at this stage. We, we set them out in that way because we thought it was helpful for you to understand the basis on which we will be approaching it with the government, which mm -hmm. is to say um, as I indicated earlier, we want there to be complete transparency, not just with the government, but with the committee, about the costs that we anticipate next year. Now, we've set it out in this way over a number of years, not to be able to add it up and arrive at a diff an another figure, but to demonstrate that some of those costs ha are 
apply for certain periods of time, not necessarily ongoing permanent costs. And that's why, for example, the cost of the COVID death investigations is shown as two years. Within the, 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 the items listed there, um, we can't choose, for example, not to investigate the COVID deaths. So we're not in a position of saying to you or to the government, well, if we don't get the funding, there are things here that can't be done. It's about the consequences of having to do those within the flat cash settlement mm -hmm. alongside everything else that I've talked about this morning. Those things become more challenging in the sense of more work for fewer people. Things will take longer. Um, the extent to which we can support victims and witnesses will, 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 will suffer. So I... I hope that answers the question. It's, 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 does, not yeah. a, it's, it's not a it's it's not a list of things which we would choose to select from. It's a list of our best view at this stage of the modelling of where we think the costs will arise and the choices will have to be made once we know what the budget is. And that's we'd be happy to share that with you as a committee at the time. Th thank you. Uh, th that's interesting confirmation because that, if for example you say certain costs will have to be met, then presumably. Uh, they would be deducted from uh, any £170 million cash settlement. So, for example, uh, because you have to deliver an obligation on COVID deaths, then that £4.5 million would come out of the one seventy. You You'd have £165 left. If, for example, the government gave you £175, take away the COVID investigation costs, you'd still be back to £170 again. That's what I'm getting to. Yes, yes. No, I think I, think, I, think, I, think I understand what the point you're making, and that's um, a perfectly acceptable way of viewing those figures, that... Um, if we have to do the COVID death investigation work, and we do have to do it, but we have to do it with 170 million, then that has yeah. an impact. We, we're, we're not going to choose not to do the work because the, we receive the flat cash settlement of 170. I'd like to move on to the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service. Um, last year, uh, in your submission, uh, in terms of budget requirements, you made a request for 145.7 million pounds. Uh, the final budget delivered was 133.5, so that was a 12 million shortfall and what was requested. Can I ask if that had any effect on the work that you did last year as we look back so we get a feel for what that might look like moving forward if you see a similar shortfall? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think as I explained earlier, part of our, our funding comes in different ways. So part of it comes through the, the, the budget settlement in terms of the budget bill and then there is subsequent in-year funding which then comes through. So the vast majority of that gap that was made up was achieved through the in-year funding. Mm -hmm. So there are some things which can't be agreed at the time of the budget bill, and that funding discussion carries on throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So there's two opportunities at the, the autumn budget revision and the spring budget revision where we can return to government to explain why those demands are still in place and, and make sure we secure the appropriate funding for them. So I say our, our core funding from government this year in terms of resource is, is 100 million for this year, um, and we have additional funding of somewhere around about 40 million, which is coming in through the, the in year budget revisions. And just to clarify your projections again, uh, you uh, modelled three scenarios, as my colleague Russell Finlay uh, highlighted that some of this um, a realistic, optimistic, and pessimistic. I think initially I get the impression you had modelled on a realistic outcome. But the commentary in your submission tends to lean more to a pessimistic outcome. Yeah, I mean, um, this where, where do you sit on that scale at the moment? Because either way, whether it's realistic, optimistic, or pessimistic, each one of them still has a funding gap. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the problem we have is that it's it, the way things are looking at the moment. The pessimistic is is, is probably the best possible. Um, we, we don't think that either the optimistic or realistic are possible. Um, this modelling was done at the time that the resource spending review um, was published. Um, since then, we've had the, the explosion of the cost of living crisis, and we all know the direction that inflation is currently heading in at the moment. Um, so this is probably the, the best case scenario as we see it at the moment. Um, but obviously, that will be very dependent on where the economy goes um, over the next couple of years in terms of what that impact is going to be. But certainly, our, our modelling projections now are based on the, the pessimistic scenario. OK, that doesn't sound very positive. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you briefly about one other issue, and that's uh, uh, maintenance using your capital budget. Because yeah. obviously we've talked a lot about the large chunk of people's budgets being on resource and yeah. pay, and indeed future pay increases, which is a whole other ballgame we haven't discussed yet, um, and the complications around the effect that has on your budgets. But capital budgets are also important. Can you talk me through, uh, for example, you, you say that... Um, uh, no increase in your core capital funding would 
for example, run the risk of safety-related incidents. Yep. Somebody could elaborate on that, and also make it virtually impossible to meet your carbon reduction uh, ambitions as well. Could you elaborate on those? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, our 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 fixed capital budget from government at the moment is currently eight million pound a year. Um, in in recent years, again through in-year funding, that's been increased to a, a minimum of fifteen million. And we see that really as being almost the minimal level that we can that we can operate on. So discussions are going on at the moment. Our, our capital budget provides mainly for our, our estate side, um, but also for our digital investment, which has been enormous, um, particularly over the course of the last couple of years, as we've completely changed um, our whole digital infrastructure. On, 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 on the backlog maintenance, we try to invest somewhere around about five or six million a year to deal with backlog maintenance. Every organisation has backlog maintenance. At one stage, we had £40, £50 million. Um, we're currently just now the right side of £30 million. Um, so our backlog maintenance has come down quite significantly. Um, again, that's been through the in-year funding that's been provided by government that's allowed us to get into that position. So at the moment, we're in a, a reasonably good position where our backlog maintenance is manageable. The level we're able to invest in each year is sufficient. There is a, a risk that if we had to make real cutbacks and we eat further into that budget, then what we find is the backlog maintenance starts to increase. Um, at the moment, I say it's in a manageable position. We've never had any significant issues. There's never been any building failures. Um, but quite clearly, it's something if you don't provide the level of investment, then very quickly it can turn the other way. And we certainly don't want to end up in the position we were eight, nine years ago where we had backlog maintenance at 40, 40, 50 million. So we, we see that as being an absolute priority to continue to invest in. Um, in terms of carbon emissions, we, we, we've made incredible progress, I think, over about the last 10 years. Um, so between 2010 and 2020, our, our carbon emissions reduced by half. Um, that was about installation of solar panel in a large amount of our courts, looking at the insulation, replacing boilers, changing controls. So we've had a, a good level of investment that's got us to a really good place. Um, that's been more challenging over the pandemic period. Um, so all our air conditioning has been running at 100% fresh air continuously. Um, so it's really impacted our energy uses. So our, our, our level of, invest, of, of reductions is now dropping slightly. We want to get back on track. Um, we've got a number of courts at the moment where we are now configuring those courts with new levels of installation, new controls, new boilers to really test the theory as far as possible is how could we move those courts to a net zero type environment. That will come with a sizable sum, I would imagine, of investment that's needed over the next 10 or 20 years. But what we're trying to set out is what would be the sensible stepping stones and what would be the sensible level of investment. Our current budget would not allow us to make that investment. Um, and that's not a criticism yet of government because we have not actually presented the case in terms of what that investment be. But we are flagging up, we, we do anticipate it will be sizable if we want to make sure that we can realistically stay on that journey towards mm -hmm. net zero. But certainly as a, a starting point, our, our core capital budget of £8 million is not sufficient for our requirements. Um, our view is that that would need to move to at least £15 million, which has been the level of funding that we have seen in recent years. I'm sure that will be noted by the government and you'll make your case diligently. The, the final point I wanted to make was really just more of a general theme, and that's an important one, is that what, what a lot of the work we do uh, in the committee is centred around outcomes for the general public, including uh, victims of crime. And from, from all of the submissions I've read, uh, notwithstanding the evidence we took last week, but the written evidence you've given um, is really the warnings about a the, the risk to the victim-centred approach that, that both of your organisations currently take, um, and that any loss of skills, expertise, staffing, resource um, would put massive pressures on that and perhaps undermine m much of the efforts you're making to move towards a more trauma-informed practice of working. Um, what reassurances can you give the public that even if you do stir down the barrel of difficult budgets over the next couple of years, or indeed any real terms cuts, uh, if that transpires, that no matter what happens, that, that victims will still remain at the heart of the justice system? Because I'm sure many people watching these sessions will be quite worried and concerned about the direction of travel. Yeah, and I say that's what why, from, from, from a court's perspective, we want to try to limit the likelihood of that occurring as, as far as we possibly can. Um, so our, our priority will be 
on the more the more serious crimes if we end up in that situation. Um, but I say equally, you know, some of the things we referred to in the submission about some of the approaches that we want to try to bring in terms of domestic abuse. Um, I say domestic abuse, 95% of cases are prosecuted in the Sheriff Court. And we genuinely believe that there's an opportunity to try to find a very different way of dealing with these cases using virtual technology, using virtual summary trials to completely transform that whole experience and that whole journey. That's not something that would come at a significant cost, but that's something we'd want to bring in to make sure that we can keep those benefits and make sure that we can maximise the experience for complainers and witnesses that are coming through in those cases. From the perspective of the fiscal service, um, the sort of difficulties you're describing and, and imagining um, would not change the priority that we would give in the place that victims would have in, in, in our work. It, it, it may make it more difficult to do, but the, 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 the priority and the place that they have would remain the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, I think that brings us nicely uh, up to our, our time allocation. So I um, just want to thank you both for attending this morning. And if uh, any members have follow-up questions, we'll uh, send them over to you in writing. So uh, many thanks indeed. And we'll just have a short suspension to allow for a change of, over of witnesses. Thank you.
Thank you very much and welcome back everybody. Um, I welcome our second panel of witnesses uh, to this morning to our meeting. Uh, Ms. Theresa Methurst, Chief Executive, and Jerry O'Donnell, uh, Interim Director of Finance with the Scottish Prison Service. Welcome to you both. Um, so I'll just open it up and invite you, Ms. Methurst, to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, um, Convener. Good morning, Convener and members of the committee. Um, my colleague and I, Gerry O'Donnell, um, also met with you last year um, to discuss the Scottish Prison Service budget, um, but welcome the opportunity to obviously respond to your request for evidence around uh, the implications of the resource spending review. So I would like to start by recognising the significant fiscal pressures facing Scottish Government and the implications for all public sector bodies who are facing difficult choices and decisions around scale and shape of service delivery, given the financial constraints. <clears throat> the SPS is similar to other justice sector organisations in that we operate 24-7 over 365 days a year. However, as I outlined in our written submission, there is a difference in our context as we are very much demand-led and are not in a position to scale back on service delivery without there being consequences to the effectiveness and impact on those in our care and on our staff. The role of SPS is to keep in secure custody all those committed by the courts, whether it be on remand or for a determined period, up to and including a life sentence. We operate 15 prisons, two of which are private sector contracts, and provide care for around 7,400 individuals. In addition, we support all activity, both in and out of establishments, whether it to be new admissions into our care, escorts to and from court, or those being liberated back to communities. And last year, this resulted in excess of 20,000 movements alone. Turnover of population is a notable difference between SPS and other justice colleagues. It is essential for officers to create rapport and build relationships with those they care for. Without this, we run a real risk of potentially hostile working environments or worse, operational instability. These relationships were never more critical than during the pandemic when officers remained a constant protective factor and supported those in our care through restrictions, changing guidelines and uncertainty. Whilst the turnover of our population does make our role as custodians more challenging, our biggest challenge has become the increasing complexity of the individuals who are placed in our care. We have always cared for vulnerable individuals, but specific needs are becoming more complex, exacerbated by issues such as substance use, trauma or adverse childhood experiences. And it should be noted that as well as caring for vulnerable individuals, we also look after those who present extreme risks due to their involvement in serious and organised crime, adding a further complexity to our area of expertise. A multifaceted and sophisticated approach is therefore required in order to mitigate risk and navigate through the mire of complexity associated with such polar opposite groups whilst continuing to meet the needs of the main cohort. As we continue to transition out of the pandemic and enter a stable period of recovery, we have to be mindful of the fragility of all of our stakeholders. Staff are indicating they are tired after a prolonged period of high alert and are concerned, as we all are, with the cost of living crisis. Those in our care are likely to be feeling the same concerns for themselves and their families. Since the resource spending review announcement, we have been working closely with Scottish Government to monitor variables that may have an impact on our service delivery, such as inflation and the rise in energy costs. Despite these uncertainties, we remain committed to remaining within the regular, regulatory and inspection framework that governs our service delivery, as well as meeting the basic decency obligations that are supported by human rights legislation. As Mr Finlay quite rightly pointed out last year, our officers do an incredible job and that is why we must remain fully focused in meeting their needs as well as the needs of those in our care by exploiting all opportunities to rationalise our delivery in a way that can drive down our cost base. Thank you very much, Convener. I look forward to taking questions. 
Thank you very much, Ms Meaders. And I'll just open it straight up. And I'm going to bring in initially uh, Jamie Green, followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning. Um, I want to start uh, just by looking at some of the budgetary pressures and scenario planning that you've done. Um, you're quite clear in your uh, uh, submission to us um, that due to the, I'm quoting you, due to the nature of our functions, there is no or at most very limited opportunity to scale back our operations without significant risk to health and welfare, reputational damage and loss of services and operational stability across the estate. Could you just elaborate what you mean by that? So the, the <clears throat> each um, prison operates on the basis of um, obviously a, a defined um, population mix and uh, size and uh, population number, um, although that can flux and change. In addition to that, we have staffing complements, which are agreed with our trade unions, which provide uh, not only safety, but the range of um, facilities, services and supports in order to support rehabilitation and ensure that people transition back to their communities as positively as possible. Where, um, we ha where there was a position that we had to scale that back in any way, what would require to happen is that we would retract our services in the way. Um, so we would look at our core functions, um, those that we are legislatively required to deliver. So, for example, um, we have a, a, a minimum threshold which would look at things like, um, for example, access to meals, access to exercise um, in the fresh air, etc., etc. And from there, you expand out the way to provide additional services. So that would be things like um, purposeful activity, which would include work, rehabilitative programmes. And then in addition to that, there would be other types of service that we could provide, which would help support people in their social endeavours um, during association, etc. So what would happen is that we would have to retract from those, um, those uh, activities that um, were not seen as being um, essential. Um, retract from those in a phased way back in to those that were seen or deemed to be essential in order to meet our legislative requirements. And in doing so, what that means is that you are restricting the time that people have um, in association or time out of cell. You are restricting the nature of engagement in purposeful activities. Um, you are also moving staff from positions where they have... Um, applied for roles and responsibilities and you're having to flex them into other roles to support just the daily operation of the establishments and therefore they can become disaffected um, with the potential obviously to look um, at other options. So what it creates is, is a, a fluctuating position which um, potentially would then really um, only put us in a position whereby we were delivering what was essential under prison rules and therefore have um, significant um, implications around um, rehabilitation, progression, um, which would also come with, with legal implications as well. Now, those, those are things that um, we actually had to do during COVID um, because of the nature of the pandemic and um, the implications of um, infection control. But as we are moving out of the pandemic phase and um, into more stable operating environments, then clearly we can use lessons that we learned there to improve our position where we put in that position again but um, that there would be significant implications, broader implications, um, that would come from providing an environment in any of our prisons where those restrictions became the norm again. I mean, that all sounds quite concerning. If, if what you're saying to me, it sounds like, is that a flat cash settlement would lead to COVID-like conditions within the prison state. And the services that, that you offer, and, and specifically of concern, would be the loss of rehabilitation services, purposeful activity, interaction with 
other services to uh, uh, to deal with things like mental health and addiction problems? Or would all of that be scaled back just simply to allow you to maintain basic safety uh, within the prison estate? It, it, it would require to be done in a, in a phased and a planned way, um, which we obviously didn't have the opportunity to do during COVID and would be very much dependent on what the actual budget figures were. Um, so when we get a, a budget settlement, there are um, options that we would need to consider, but using some of the learning from COVID um, to look at where the, the highest priorities are. I suppose that the, the, the area of increasing concern would be around the complexity of the population where there is likely to be more investment required. So um, elements um, that we are in, uh, experiencing just now, so increasing um, social care costs, for example. Um, we're also uh, serious in organised crime. Again, you know, really positive outcomes from other parts of the justice sector have resulted in around 8% of our population now being involved in serious organised crime, which means that we need to develop a strategy um, and having a strategy within a custodial environment will come potentially with additional costs. So there are things that require some investment, which, which will also then have an implication on any disinvestment um, across the estate. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was struggling in your submission to find a, a forecast of the next couple of years, but reading between the lines, you say that for the year 2023-24, uh, you require an uplift of £40 million to your budget to maintain existing services. That's just, I presume, just one year. But what, what does that figure look like for the next couple of years over the period of the RSR? And uh, how does that equate to what you're forecasting at the moment in terms of your requirements of budget? In other words, what is, what is your total ask of government uh, oh. versus what the RSR actually says will be delivered if it comes to pass? So the, 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 I'll, I'll, the, 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 as with others who have um, presented evidence, I think the, the issue for us is that, and particularly I think for us in prisons, um, even since the RSR has been published, the position has fluctuated and changed because of the changing nature of the pressures around energy, pay um, and inflationary costs. So we have been monitoring it very closely and it has shifted in this year alone. But I'll um, ask Jerry to come in on the, the overall impact over the four years. Yes, please. OK, so you, the, the £40.8 in the paper uh, for next year is based on an assessment of uh, a cost pressure this year rolling into next year. Um, since our budget last year, we've obviously had um, significant increases in costs and inflation, etc., cost of living. And what that has done is, as I say, we, we are a net cost pressure of £14.5 million this year. So that's being addressed in the, the, the spring budget revision. Um, but that will roll into next year. Um, we have um, challenges in the next year with our um, 20, over 21% 20, of our costs are with private sector uh, contracts, where we are we're contractually obliged um, but with these contracts to um, put in price increases based on RPI, CPI numbers, and at the moment they're quite high. Um, so that's kind of uh, pushing that number uh, next year up as well. And we've got modest increases in for uh, you know, pay assumptions and things like that. So that's the number for next year. The following years are based on a kind of a average assumption of about a 3% uplift overall in our cost base which will be challenging if the current market uh, economic factors uh, uh, continue. So the year following would be 40 million plus 3% the year yeah, after that? It, it, it goes, from, goes from 40 million and then we're looking for a further uh, kind of 15 million the following year. Okay. Um, I'll let others come in. I'll make them back to the issue of pay later though. That's yeah. okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, Colette Stevenson, I think you've maybe got a supplementary on this. Yeah, yeah. just <clears throat> you touched upon the increased costs um, on utilities. And, and I think, um, Theresa, you, you mentioned as well um, this morning that it's gone up by, was it 47% this year? Can I ask um, just about a fixed rate? Where is tied in, in in terms of procuring a fixed rate with utility companies? and? 
And, and is that something that, you know, I, I mean, obviously everybody's having to deal with uh, the impact of increased energy costs, but I'm not sure from a public service point of view if that ended, that framework ended, um, if you could touch upon that. And initially, um, if you don't mind, and then I'll hand over to Jerry. I mean, I think with, with all of these um, cost pressures, particularly around um, inflation as well, what we have to um, understand is even where we have procured um, uh, contracts for things like, um, for example, food, um, our contractors are experiencing real pressures and therefore there have got to be um, revisions made um, in order to ensure that we can con continue with those contracts and procure the services that we need. So there, there are contextual elements to it where we obviously um, require to continue services, and particularly the food one gives me um, most cause for concern, but where um, our contractors are still able to provide those services, we obviously need to be able to, to at least meet um, their needs um, in part because of the nature of the inflationary pressures and how it's impacting on them as well as service providers. If you want to come in on yeah. utilities. Well, on utilities, um, we procure our utilities through a, govern a Scottish Government contract, as many other public sector bodies do as well. Um, we do have kind of forecasts. Um, it will become clearer as we go into the early next year what, what the, the figures are going to be for the following year. But we understand that it will be uh, not as high as this year, but it will still be an increase. Our, our net position increase uh, uh, was 47 per cent, but that's a net, and that's combined electricity and gas. Unfortunately for SPS, we are heavy users of gas. Um, it's uh, throughout all our establishments. That's our primary heating system. Thank you. Can I just follow up on that? And you, you know, within your own submission as well, you're talking about you know the estates as well. And one of the things is obviously the the uh, Berlini replacement. And um, trying to obviously meet net zero as well. Have you have you are even considered um, maybe using that estate because a brand new estate that's getting built as a district heating system, whereby you would be you know supplier and provider, and it would generate income for you as well. Yeah, I, I I don't know the exact detail of that. Um, uh, what, um, in terms of a district heating system, I, I, I know it has been discussed. Uh, it, Berlinia is still in its early stages. Uh, it's a contract we've just awarded this year in terms of a, a, a development, uh, the design of, of a, uh, an establishment. Um, but one of the points I will make in relation to net zero is replacing Berlini will give, um, will reduce at, uh, at 21 per cent of our scope CO2 emissions. So it's, and t for moving towards net zero, it's a, uh, a kind of project that's going to be very substantial. I, I think, Ms Stevenson, you're right to raise the point, and, and it's something that we would consider, um, and we did consider for Highland as well, because that's obviously an underway. Um, so for, for all of our projects um, and major builds, um, in Highland, I think, will be the first net zero prison. Um, and that's certainly what we intend to achieve with regards to Glasgow, which is a much bigger build as well. OK, thank you. And I'll bring Russell Finlayne on this. Thank you. It's a continuation of the questions around energy cost and usage. Um, I mean, it's something that we don't really think about. That's the equivalent of heating and providing light for 10,500 family homes. So it's a, clearly a huge amount of the budget. Now, in your submission, in the letter, it says that this has risen 47% for 22-23 from the previous year. Now, coincidentally, the Crown Office's um, submission also refers to energy costs, and they say for 22-23, this was largely uh, offset, uh, not not suffering to the same extent because of Scottish Government securing advanced purchase. Do you know if that's a separate scheme? Is that something that you? are not part of, it may just be particular government buildings, or am I misunderstanding that? And indeed you were part of it, but that still resulted in a 47% increase. Yeah. yeah I believe we are part of the same um, procurement contract. Um, 
again, it probably I don't know the detail of uh, the, the other body. Um, it's where our, it's your baseline. It's where your budgets were, um, and I can only say that. And uh, for us, and it was a 47% increase in our spend from last year to this year. Yeah. And going back to um, the, the same issue, um, is, is there an optimal temperature that is required either? By guidance or by law within the prisons. But it's not. It's not a. It's um, health and safety legislation. So we have to comply with health, health and safety legislation. So, with regards to um, heating for offices, etc., then we would comply um, with the law. Um, we have, uh, I suppose, arrangements. The, 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 di the difficulty for us is that. In, particularly in our older buildings, when the heating is turned off and turned on, it takes quite a time before the heating is mobilised. So if you, you know, go through a cold spell, you turn the heating on and you have that um, minimum uh, threshold, then if the milder weather comes, do you turn it off again? Or do you keep it on? Because clearly, you know, you don't want to waste fuel. So we try and be as fuel efficient as we can. But the systems do take time to um, to uh, restart and sure. decommission at the start. And is there a temperature that is required for prisoners? Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Can I come in? It's something actually we have raised, and first of all, their own establishments and. Uh, having zoning will be very difficult to have different temperatures at different uh, parts of the building. But we also have uh, situations where, um, for kind of uh, the, the clothing that prisoners may be wearing for anti ligature reasons, etc., might be lighter, etc. So there are some areas of the building we have to keep a higher temperature than would probably be normal uh, because just uh, for the health and safety reasons. I, I, that, my answer would be I, I, I honestly don't know. I've not come across a temperature, Mr Finlay. Certainly for staff offices, there is a temperature. Yeah. But um, the thresholds I'm aware of are, are more around cell size, etc. But certainly I can have a look at that. And yeah, sure. I'm just given the, the massive cost increase, whether yes. that was something that's been looked at. But thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to bring in Rona shortly, but before I do so, I wonder if I can just come back to... Um, a comment that you made in your opening remarks, Ms Nedhurst, and it relates to the sort of growing proportion of the prison population who are vulnerable um, in terms of age, sort of complex uh, medical, personal care needs and so on. And I'm interested to hear a little bit more about what might be the likely impact uh, on this group of prisoners um, in terms of um, resourcing the necessary staff, uh, training, case management, uh, trauma-informed approaches. Um, so if that kind of starts to come under pressure, uh, I'm just interested in a little bit more commentary around what the implications of that might be. So in respect of... Um the increasing health complexities. I think the increasing health complexities are, are very broad in the range and don't solely relate to age. There are mm -hmm. social care needs for some of our younger population. We're seeing um, increasing people, uh, the number of people who are coming into custody, an increasing number with neurodevelopmental um, issues. So, you know, th that complexity, I think, um, is where that there are greater needs around not just um, support from our N NHS uh, colleagues mm -hmm. in terms of um, case management and training, but also um, much more intensive training for our staff group. And clearly, when you're asking staff to flex in and out, you know, that, that um, you know, a, a multiple uh, range of different <coughs> roles, then the training demands are much greater. So there is a requirement to invest in training for staff and ensure that they are equipped, because we are seeing um, 
through some of that um, ageing population um, requirements for you know, people who are suffering from uh, early s onset dementia, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. So there are requirements for additional support um, in relation to training. But in terms of how, how we would manage that and what the impact would be is that we would try and protect as possible those uh, who are most vulnerable and ensure that we prioritise the support to them um, as far as we can, uh, depending on whatever resource constraints we face. We face. Yes. Thank you. And, and just following on from that, um, from a sort of capital budget perspective, um, and you know, the committee visited uh, a, a prison last year and saw for ourselves some of the sort of challenges that exist around caring for um, that sort of cohort of prisoners, uh, as you've outlined, perhaps with uh, dementia and other uh, physical medical conditions. Um, what might be the implications in terms of your ability to sort of improve and reconfigure the actual prison estate to make sure that their needs are met going forward? So we do, we do have um, a, a maintenance budget um, and we prioritise within that budget how that is spent. Some of the um, equipment we obviously uh, require to access through our NHS colleagues. It's not, not solely for, for us. Um, it, it is an, in, an increasing challenge in mm -hmm. terms of numbers and the complexity of care that people provide not just in relation to social care, but palliative care as well. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, prisons are built as secure facilities, um, so it does require adaptation. Um, we have, over a number of years, adapted cells um, as funding has become available and the need has arisen. Um, but I can foresee that there will be more challenges around how we can deliver that mm -hmm. over the next few years, depending on, on what the actual budget position is likely to be. That, th 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 thanks very much. Okay, I'll bring in uh, Rona Bikai, uh, followed by Pauline McNeill. Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, I, I want to ask you about um, the impact on capital spending in the prison estate um, and how that could be impacted by a potential shortfall in, in, in funding. Um, I was quite alarmed to, to see, alarmed to see in your um, submission. Um, and you talk about the women's estate and you say that it would, I'm not saying you said you would do this, but you say it could be possibly one of the measures you would have to take to be considered for immediate rationalisation. So I wonder if you could expand on that and um, also just, you know, what, what impact it would have in relation to the new uh, Berlin, etc, etc. Um, but the, the women's estate question first, please. No problem. Thank you very much, Ms Mackay. Um, I'm sorry for alarming you. That, that was actually a, a, positive, um, a positive statement. But um, so the, the consequence of opening the two community custody units this year and opening the new national facility next year means that not all of the current accommodation for women is being fully utilised. So therefore, it would be incumbent on us um, to rightly look at what kind of accommodation we require for women going forward across the whole estate, bearing in mind um, that we currently have women in Grampian, Greenock, Edinburgh and Pullman. Um, so we can, we can, with the new facilities, um, we can look at how best to utilise the facilities for women, how best to support them. So it's not deprioritising women in custody, it's actually just rationalising the accommodation that currently, accommodation that currently exists um, because we would have more than we actually required and therefore we can release some of that accommodation for use for men where there is a bit more pressure um, on our population. You're looking confused. Can, can I stop? <laughs> I am a bit confused, I'll be honest with you. We, we visited um, the um, oh, Lilius facility yes. for, for women, which was which was great, and I know the the Bella in, uh, is open in, in Bears Den, uh, in uh, sorry in Dundee, um, and you know they're, they're quite small. They, mm. they don't take a lot, so I'm, I'm I'm not quite following how you could get more 
accommodation so, from them? At the moment, the current accommodation for women is not being fully utilised. Um, so we, um, in having those two new facilities, the national facility um, is, will give us slightly more spaces, I think, than we're currently using in court. And, and that's not under well. threat, the new it's, facility? No, 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 right. not under threat. Okay, so, so between those new facilities, the fact that the number of women in custody has come down over a number of years, we're still sitting around 280, I think, we can look at, so where are the best facilities for women? How can we then rationalise that estate okay. and ensure that, that we can release some of that accommodation um, for use um, for the male estate where there is more pressure. But no, it's not, it's not a case no. of um, overcrowding the accommodation. It's uh, ensuring that we're using the facilities and maximising them. And the rollout of the new custody units will go ahead as planned? Yes. The ones that are not? That's yes. Good. Yeah. I took entirely the wrong meaning from your, your word rationalisation. <laughs> I apologise for that. Um, as far as Berlini and you know um, future planning goes, is that would that be put on ice or...? Did the Berlin still go ahead? So the the, um, the funding, uh, capital funding, um, obviously comes through the infrastructure investment plan. Um, the replacement for Berlin and um, for Inverness are both in the five-year plan. Um, the initial stages of that plan, so this year's funding, was used to award the contract for Glasgow. Um, but there is a potential gap in funding, um, capital funding, coming up in year... Um, um, years 24-25 uh, and 25-26. 24-25 and 25-26. Yeah. Now, the Scottish Government are aware of that. Um, is that not the years that Berlin is supposed to be... 26. 26, 26. yeah. So, okay. so there, there, there are capital pressures um, in later years that would need to be resolved, but the Scottish Government are well aware of that and they understand um, that we will require additional funding for Glasgow. Okay, thank you. Thanks, hey, thanks yes. very much. Uh, I'm just going to bring in Russell Finlay to follow up on Rona's questions and then I'll bring in Pauline McNeill. Thank you. I think um, your answers have partly covered the ground that I was going to ask about, but it relates to the estates. Um, in your submission, the budget for the for next four years amounts to about £440 million, which is mostly about building prisons, but it's also to do with the cost of providing cables for internet access and phone, phone lines and so on. Um, now, we already know the Stirling prison is three years late. Um, Berlin, or the new Berlin is due to open 2026, with Highland due to be finished in 2024. Um, now, given last week Police Scotland told us that inflation around building costs is much higher than general inflation, I think they put a figure on it of around 30%. You've already suggested that in two, the final two years of the projections, you're already expecting an overrun. Can you quantify that? Do you have any idea of what the figures will be and where the money comes from? Have government committed to meeting those costs or will the building have to stop? Or will compromises have to be made? So, uh, I think um, a number of questions there, Mr Finlay. Sure. I'll, hopefully, I'll, I'll answer all of them. So, the um, committed funding that we have already commenced um, is in the budget, and uh, we have been given um, in this year's budget, and obviously um, for, for next year as well. There are funding pressures, as we've experienced with um, the build for Stirling. Um, I'm not sure if it's three years late, I'd need to check that. But certainly for, for Stirling, um, there, there were additional inflationary pressures. We have um, inflationary pressures for Highland, um, and we've shared that with government. We don't have a cost, we have a, a cost envelope for uh, the replacement for Glasgow, but that initial cost profile has yet to be finalised. So until we've got that final position, it's really difficult to see what the gap in funding is likely to be. Um, and we expect that um, in the next few weeks, I think. Does 30% inflation yes. sound reasonable? Um, certainly for, for um, Highland, I think it was somewhere between 25 and 30 per cent um, was the, the additional cost pressure. So that does seem reasonable, yes. So there will be a sort of serious conversation required with government about mm -hmm. the Glasgow prison? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. OK, I'll bring in Pauline McNeill, followed by Fulton McGrath. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, good morning. So I'm reading in the notes that you provide for the committee that approximately 21% of the SPS resort budget is for payments to the private sector for the provision of two private prisons. That seems quite a high figure. But you go on to say that these contracts are contractual built-in inflation mechanisms based on CPI and RPI. So the private two private prisons are getting 11.4%. It just seems so grossly unfair then that the public sector prisons are having to operate within a reduced, is it minus 7.8 per cent, but private prisons in, under the service are going to benefit from 11.4 per cent. Is that right? Sorry, can I also come in at that point? Um, it's not just the two private prisons, it's also the court custody yeah. and escort service as well. So it's three uh, contracts, two prisons and uh, at the escort service. The, the, the way that the contracts are set is clearly that there are um, in, inflationary, um, the RPI, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the pricing index and how it's used as part of the contract arrangements at the start of, uh, at the commencement of the contract. Um, and therefore, um, the additional cost pressures that we will experience because of that will have to be found from within our budget. Um, and it does put pressure on, obviously, the amount of resource that then remains for public sector um, prisons for running a, private, uh, a public sector prisons, yes. If, if I just also come in, I mean, the Adiwell contract was signed in 2008, and for a number of years the RPI was at a low uh, percentage, mm. so it's just that the... It's an unfortunate time for us that, uh, that it's a, a high percentage. Yeah, I think that's got to be acknowledged that no one thought in 2008 that uh, we'd ever reach double figures, probably, yeah. for, for inflation, but now we have. Is there any scope for going back on those contracts, given the extraordinary circumstances that we're all living in, um, notwithstanding the line of questioning my colleague Russell Finlay's put to you about the cost of energy alone, never mind running the estate. I mean, is there any scope for going back to these contracts and saying, we really want to put this level of extraordinary pressure on the public sector when you don't feel any pain, <laughs> but the public sector does? So I think um, that th th there are... Cir different circumstances for each of the contracts. So mm -hmm. for the Kilmarnock contract, that one is coming to an end anyway. It's right. coming back into um, public sector operation in 2024. So we are moving into the last um, year and a half of, the, of that contract. And um, that contract has, has run very well um, and um, is, is really, I think, at, at the moment... Um, in a, it, 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 it operates and functions well and we are content with, with the arrangements around Kilmarnock. With regards to GOAMI, we are experiencing um, some real pressures around uh, contract delivery with GOAMI, part of which is being pressures around some of the changes in the way that... Um, Justice is working now in relation to virtual courts, etc., and we're working really closely with them to um, try and manage their way through those pressures. But it has been a really challenging time for them. And because they're now having to um, diversify and deliver um, some aspects of the contract, which we didn't anticipate, so, for example, hospital... Um, hospital uh, Details have gone up and are much higher than they were previously. So it is having an impact on the overall um, operation of the contract. So we're working really closely with them because we understand that there are limitations around the contract budget and um, how that's been applied in relation to their performance. So that, that I think, again, is, is a separate construct. With regards to, to Adiwell, um, as Jerry says, that was um, awarded in 2008. I think there is potential to have discussions with Adiwell around the cost pressures that we're experiencing and the implications on the contract. Um, and uh, certainly it's something that um, I have raised internally that we probably do need to have 
discussions with them and get them to the table um, to better understand whether or not there is any room for movement. Thank you very much. Just finally, you said there that, that there's um, pressures on the contract with GOE, is mm -hmm. it? GOE. Um, so if there's, virtual, if there's more virtual appearances, does that mean that they are not moving those prisoners? Is there a cost saving there? It's, it's quite complex because um, it, it's where they require to have people um, as much as the, the vehicles. So the vehicles is only one element of it. Right. But it's also about um, how they cover with, with people. So if you've got somebody covering virtual custodies, and court, and they're on vehicles, and they're do, you know it, it's 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 created an added complexity mm -hmm. that they are are struggling with. But we, as I say, we are trying to work with them to help simplify where we can, and we're working with um, Scottish courts in particular to simplify where we can um, and resolve some of the tensions and ensure that it becomes much more effective in terms of performance again. Understand. So I, I, I'm just trying to think of a scenario that I know about. So, where on first appearance, if prisoners are appearing in, um, in London Road Police Station, let's say, and some prisoners are, are having to go to Sheriff Court, whereas previously they were taking all the prisoners to the one place, they're having. Yeah. To, I understand. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And I'll bring in Fulton McGregor now. Um, Good thanks, Commissioner, and um, good morning uh, to the panel. Thanks very much for your evidence so far. Uh, my question was actually on the same lines as Paul McNeil around about Adiwell and Kilmarnock. So a lot, a lot of it has been covered. But um, I mean, I, I was actually looking back um, to 2016, and I found a question that I asked on this, um, and it was saying that you know the the, the PFI payments on Adiwell were going to cost taxpayers nearly a billion pounds. I'm assuming that perhaps um, you know, going in the back of your question there, it's, it's, it's even up on that, so that's an absolutely ridiculous amount. Um, you're saying that just now that the, can you confirm with the RPR currently at twelve point six percent then is this are you going to be liable for something approaching fourteen percent of the cost of Adiwell? And going on the back of your um, the back of what you said there about Kilmarnock, is it is it time or what plans are afoot to bring Adiwell back into the public sector as well? I'll answer the first part. Um, I mean, the, the contract's not a straight, um, you know, uh, RPI uplift. There's there's different elements of the the contract. Um, the the highest proportion of the contract is RPI plus one percent, uh, but there's elements that are kind of fixed cost. We've kind of Calculated that it's about a net 11% increase is the kind of figure for next year. The contract for Adiwell runs until 2033, um, and uh, obviously, if well, as I understand it, it is a contract for 25 years. Therefore, there wouldn't be the option to break into that any earlier. That's what I was going to going to ask about. And, um, You've, you've already called it, but I was going to ask you to excuse my uh, naivety, because um, you know, is there no way out of these contracts? No, is that, is that basically it? There would probably be significant penalties, um, right. as Which well as outweigh. reputational damage. Right. Um, you know, when you sign a contract 25 years, then people anticipate that that contract will be fulfilled. Um, so I, I would imagine there would be significant penalties. Um, as a consequence, I accept, so, the, I accept the penalties argument, but I mean, in terms of the reputational damage, I think if the public um, knew that we're talking about billions of taxpayers' money on these and that money, that then perhaps that that would um, you know that would negate that argument. But I accept if the if the cost of coming out such a contract is going to end up outweighing um, mm -hmm. any benefit achieved, then understand that. Sorry, Jenny, I interrupted you. I, I was going to say um, the. Our status as an executive agency uh, prevents us, I think, yeah, at the moment, you know, potentially of buying out the contract. I know, um, I think, possibly, if you're a non-public departmental body, would have a, an opportunity to do something. So there's also a, a different that aspect to it as well uh, as our status. Okay, thanks very much on that. Um, 
the final question I wanted to ask is basically a question I asked the last panel and I asked the previous panels last week. It's about um, your, inter, your interlink with the other justice agencies. You heard this morning's evidence. I'm assuming you probably tuned in to the police and fire service last week. You're all kind of saying a very similar thing um, as a very bleak picture. Um, there, there's no getting away from that. Um, have you thought about how um, impact on, say, police or you know courts, as you heard this morning, fire service, other criminal justice agencies, a flat cash settlement for them will impact yourselves? How do you take that um, into account when you're considering your own budget considerations? So, as um, my colleague, Mr McQueen, mentioned earlier, we do have the Criminal Justice Board, which has been in operation since the start of the pandemic. Um, and we've used that as a really positive vehicle along with the Justice Board um, to have discussions around budget, budget implications as well as the resource spending review. Um, and clearly, as we are all facing, as you see, very similar challenges, the need for us to work um, more effectively, collectively together, I think, becomes um, increasingly pressing. So I think the relationships and the understanding um, as was outlined earlier, that has grown and developed over the last two and a half years in particular, will stand us in good stead to help shape areas where we can collaborate more effectively and be more joined up as a justice sector going forward um, to meet the challenges that we're facing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Colette Stevenson, if you'd like to come in, and then I'll bring in Jamie. Okay, thanks, convener, um, and uh, good morning. Um, in a, a written submission um, to this committee, um, the, uh, Wendy Sinclair Gibbon, uh, the Inspector of Prisons, raised concerns um, that if there was a proposed flat rate um, cash settlement for the prison service, then you know there may be insufficient to meet the, the minimum requirements. And you touched upon it earlier with, with Jamie Green in terms of rehabilitative programmes, um, purposeful activity as well. And um, also the fact that the, the, I think 28 per cent, I believe, who are currently in the you know the prison population just now, are on remand, don't get that, and and, and some of them are locked up for like 22 hours. And I know that that was a challenge during COVID, but I just want to know what your views are on that because there's a potential there as well, and and we were contravening uh, you know prisoners' human rights as well. Much, Ms. Stevenson. I think I wrote to the committee convener um, a, a few weeks ago and outlined some of the um, changes that have been taking place during COVID, including um, because of that shift in the remand population in particular, um, establishments were now opening up much more activity space to those on remand because there was more capacity to do so. So there is more engagement for those on remand to um, be involved either in work or purposeful activity. Um, in one way, shape or form. So that is a much wider offer and certainly um, a, a much greater focus on health and health interventions, including um, support for recovery from uh, substance uh, use, etc. So all of that um, in, different, in different shapes and different offers um, is something which, which is available um, across prisons. Um, Obviously, I've read um, the Chief Inspector's um, submission and um, I understand her concerns. Um, there are always real tensions, and I think probably for me more so because of the restrictions of the last two and a half years, because we have not been able to support people's rehabilitation in the way that we would have done previously, um, because we were responding to the pandemic then it does mean that it makes it more critical that how we reinstate services, how we shape them and how we support people um, is, is done in a way that will be um, as effective, if not more effective, than, than the, the, the shape of the service prior to the pandemic. So there is learning that we are taking from uh, the pandemic. For example, um, a lot of the feedback that we've had through um, some of the... the, uh, the contact arrangements in prisons um, has suggested that prisoners feel much um, safer in smaller cohorts. They feel much more 
um, able to engage because they know the people around them. They don't feel um, that they will be open to bullying and intimidation that they would have done previously. So as we're reinstating services, we are looking at how that can be done in much smaller groupings in a much more manageable way in order to um, affect greater change in people because they feel more comfortable, more relaxed about that um, kind of engagement. So whilst um, the, 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 the descriptor that I provided for Mr Green earlier about constricting services commensurate with your kind of staff and profile and your, your budgets is something that we would, we would have to do and we would need to look at how best to manage that uh, depending on where the highest risks lay. Nevertheless, there are areas that I would absolutely want to protect and ensure that we could improve on um, taking that learning from the, um, the pandemic. I mean, the other, the other thing for me around this is that in terms of our workforce and our workforce profile, you know, we have, uh, it's very welcome, but we have far more women working in the service now than, than we ever did before. Um, you know, and the, the way our working arrangements, I think, need to reflect a more modern um, approach as well as um, a workforce demand approach now. I think people are looking for much more flexibility in their working arrangements. So there are um, aspects and elements of our working practice, whether that be in um, our prisons or whether it be in our support services, that we are going to have to consider and look and reshape and change in order to ensure that we re remain a, an attractive employer, um, but also ensure that it supports maybe a different operating model going forward. Can I, yeah, can I just uh, touch upon uh, you know, the way it is at the moment? Um, mm. My understanding is, as it stands, that um, from a Friday to a Sunday, prisoners are locked up. They, they, they get locked up from five o'clock. They're limited in terms of uh, the, the purposeful activity they do um, what, you know, in the prison estates. Is that because they are reduced staff function? And, and is that something you, you've touched upon how you know, looking at, you know, a more modern workforce, be more flexible as well. Is that something you would look at in terms of the weekends where, where prisoners are locked up from Friday right through till the Monday morning? Um, so the, 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 the weekend regimes haven't really changed much over many, many years. Um, and um, there are some prisons that may lock up at tea time on a Friday, but I would have to check that. I think most don't, so most prisons will be open until half past eight, nine o'clock on a Friday evening. Over a weekend, um, the, the core day, if you like, will be between eight, eight and five in the evening, um, but there will be a period during the day when people will be locked up, say, after, after lunchtime. We normally have services, gym activities. Um, there might be... A, third sector groups such as EE or you know other types of groups that might come in at the weekend but but the amount of um, activity at the weekend has always reflected I suppose what society reflected which was weekends were downtime as opposed to activity time so the main bulk of activity has always been Monday to Friday mm -hmm. I think um, and evenings were association time weekends were association time it's become very clear over the last two and a half years that that prisoners and staff don't want that free association time. So we are going to look at not just what happens on a Monday to Friday, but we will apply that to the weekend as well um, to look at how, how more productive we can be and the type of engagement, because it's not just about, um, I suppose, the, the, those harder edge elements like criminogenic need, etc. But there is that social aspect to um, people's rehabilitation, their health, that need to be improved, and a lot of those kinds of activities could be hosted at a weekend. Um, so, yes, we would need to look at the full seven-day operating. OK, thank you. Thanks very much. And I'll move straight across to Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I'd just like to follow on from my uh, previous uh, line of questioning around scenario planning. Um, is there any concern within the prison service that due to the events of the last two and a half years, which you admit involve a, a lack of the rehabilitation services you would like to have provided, 
coupled with the p real potential for reverting back to a COVID-like clampdown on what happens in a prison, that that might create a, if you like, a pressure pot that would lead to increased violence in prisons, further attacks on prison staff, or even the potential for rioting. So the, the reverting back to COVID would be very much dependent on budgets. Um, and clearly that's not somewhere where we would want to be. And I don't think that would be somewhere Scottish Government would want us to be either, because clearly protecting the public, keeping people safe, um, it's not just about keeping people behind um, closed doors. It's also about providing those types of um, supports through crim criminogenic need and, and rehabilitation. Um, what I would say is that the relationships between our staff and our population are positive. Um, and I think the Chief Inspector of Prisons would reflect that. Um, and despite the two and a half years that we've had, have actually strengthened because of the way that the relationships have been able to grow because of those restrictions. There has been more time for staff to spend with those in their care and therefore build um, much more meaningful relationships. So I think, for me, that gives a really solid platform to move forward with any kind of restrictions that we might have to impose dependent on budget. The only thing that I would add is that um, there is evidence um, from England and Wales through, uh, I think, the National Audit Office uh, produced a report and the Chief Inspector of Prisons down there produce, produces reports around um, which d do reflect that disinvestment can have an impact on things like violence and vulnerability. Um, but certainly for prisons and where we are at the moment, um, that's not a concern that I would have just now. Uh, and I think that's important because over the last four or so years, there have been over 100,000 working days lost due to staff absences, mostly around mental health, uh, although there are some physical attacks as well. That's clearly already a, an issue uh, for staff. Uh, talking about staff, could you give me an indication of what staffing levels are like at the moment? Uh, what's the sort of scale of, of vacancies or understaffing in any particular uh, uh, a custodial institution or right across the spectrum of the estate? So I, can, I, can, I can't give it a breakdown by establishment, but I can certainly provide it um, across the, the operational um, side of the organisation. So at the moment we're running, I think, approximately 110 vacancies, um, and that is around a 3% um, vacancy gap at the moment. Um, that is lower than we would normally um, carry, uh, I would have to say. But as with other parts of the public sector, we are experiencing challenges um, in recruitment, um, both in relation to ensuring that we have sufficient people coming through and attracting sufficient people, um, as well as um, having the capacity to support the um, ongoing recruitment challenges. But I do think that what we have learned from that already this year is that there has been much more bespoke recruitment activity. So for particular sites who are experiencing um, greater um, vacancy um, gaps, there have been a lot of recruitment fears, a lot of reach into parts of the communities we probably wouldn't have reached into previously, which um, I am hopeful will, will in increase the diversity of our um, organisation and particularly our staff group. And that is certainly paying dividends both in terms of developing more positive relationships, a better understanding of prisons, but also providing us with um, potential areas of improving our workforce profile. Uh, we heard last week uh, quite clearly from other justice partners that um, a flat cash settlement or a real terms cut in your budget would equate to either a reduction in headcount or a pay freeze. And it's as simple a simpler choice as that. In your scenario, which of those is the most likely, given that you have committed to what I believe to be an, a, a, an above public sector pay promise? Uh, and what are the effects of uh, any potential pay freeze or reduction in staff via those scenarios played out? So the, the pay um, negotiations are still ongoing at the current time. Um, so they have, have yet to conclude for this year. Pay, obviously, both for this year and for subsequent years um, is a concern. Um, 
the issue with regards to a reduction in staff, um, given our um, population profile, given the arrangements that we have in a complemented position, would be very difficult to achieve. Um, equally, I think the uh, potential for a pay freeze would be incredibly difficult to achieve. I think it would create significant um, challenges in our industrial relations um, environment um, and uh, yeah, could, could result in, in some form of, of uh, action by any one of the constituent trade unions. What sort of action? Um, it could be up to um, and including in, uh, industrial action. Strike, strike. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that they're able to do that, are they? Yeah. Yes. Um, in your submission, you say that a flat, on, on, on the issue of pay, which is 60% of your, your cost base, I appreciate you talk about energy and food, but there are 4 and 2% respectively of your overall budget. Pay is clearly the lion's share of your costs. Mm -hmm. A flat cash position would require restraint on pay increases and a review of the current employee operating model. I'm still trying to get to the bottom of whether... You, you, you say that neither can take place, but it sounds like both would have to take place. So I'm, I still don't understand what a flat cash settlement will look like on pay and staffing numbers. So any changes to our um, operating model, any changes to our workforce model would require engagement with our trade union side. That engagement is likely to take time. Um, and I have no doubt that there would be areas that we would agree on and areas that we wouldn't agree on. But that's not something that I would envisage we could um, achieve within uh, the current, uh, either the current year or the next financial year. That would take um, in the short to medium term um, to achieve and ach uh, reach uh, an agreement on both of those elements. Sounds like you might not have any choice, though. If a flat, you, know, you, you get what you get in terms of finances for resource budgets. So, you know, what, it's one or the other, isn't it? We don't know what we're going to get yet. And, and at that point, then I'll need to have a look and consider what are the implications, what are the options that are likely to achieve a balanced budget, and what are the options that would take longer to achieve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. OK, um, I think that brings us to the end of this session. So uh, many thanks for your attendance uh, this morning. Uh, obviously, if there are any other issues that members want to raise, we'll follow those up uh, in writing. So thank you again. And we'll just have a short suspension to allow our witnesses to leave. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So our next item of business today is to discuss recent correspondence that the committee has received and I refer members to paper number three. Um, so you'll see that the, our clerks have suggested some ideas uh, of how we may want to take forward the various issues. Uh, however, I'd like to open it up to members to raise uh, any points or make any suggestions. So um, I'll take the letters in turn and the first one uh, is our correspondence from the Scottish Prison Service on the cost of the women's estate. So, does anybody have any points or questions that they want to raise, Jamie? Uh, thank you, convener. It's probably something we should have asked <laughs> Theresa Metzger while she was here, <laughs> talking about budget. I guess there's a budget element to it, but I, I, I think while well, she has answered the question, um, I think we weren't just looking for the numbers. One of the things that came up in our discussion around this was the um, the, the ability to compare costs across uh, the different estate. So I, I have no idea if five million is, is good value or poor value for, for money. Given the nature of what, what those premises are doing, uh, having having seen them, um, I, I'm sure it's, it's all very worthwhile. But, for example, it, there, we know that there's a, uh, quite a substantial lower uh, number of people that they, they can facilitate, for example, and therefore £5 million, pounds, is that for 10 people, 30 mm -hmm. people, 100 people? How does that compare to historic estates or other types of uh, of, of custody units? So um, I, I think maybe some more detail around that would have been more helpful and to, to make that comparative analysis, because that really was the reason for the question, not just mm -hmm. the number itself. OK, thanks very much. Um, I suppose what's coming into my mind on that point is perhaps I think when we visited the Lilia Centre there was some uh, an update on the, an evaluation process that was potentially going to be uh, undertaken to, I suppose to monitor outcomes and look at the effectiveness of the unit but I think it's a, it's a good point to raise and I'd be certainly be keen to understand the sort of cost benefits from the, 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 the two new units. So thanks for that. Any other points that anybody wants to raise? Pauline? Yeah. Pauline? Um, I'm just saying to Rona there, I mean, it, 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 couldn't be any, it couldn't be any bleaker. I mean, I've never had anything like it. And all the time I've been here. I mean, the... It's, it's really trying to. Hold. I think on the evidence we had from the Crown Office Property Fiscal Service. Um, I think we're 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 just at oh, the sorry. point of discussing the letters, letters. Uh, our correspondence. <laughs> so, p p p p if you don't mind, just right. park that, right. and we'll come and we'll come back to it. You know, we're very enthusiastic. <laughs> um, so we're just having um, a discussion about the uh, correspondence that the committee has received, and we're. Um, the first piece of correspondence relates to the update on the women's estate. So, any other queries? So, are we happy? Just obviously um, picking up the suggestion that Jamie made. Are we content to um, to obviously write back to the prison service and thank them for their uh, their correspondence? And we'll obviously monitor um, developments in and around the sort of benefits and evaluation of the. Of the unit. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, um, and the second letter was from the WISE group on the issue of medical prescriptions on uh, liberation. So again, I'll just open it up to members uh, if you've got any comments that you'd like to make on the correspondence. Rona. Um. Well, just, I mean, at face value, it would seem that they're saying things have got better, you know. Um, it, it doesn't seem to be as um, so much of a problem as it was when we visited in May. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure, to be honest, where, where we can, we can go, go from there. Um, I mean, the through care thing is another issue, but, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really have any constructive thing to say about it, really. OK, thanks very much. Anybody else? Russell? Yeah, uh, just um, I think it's worth noting that it's uh, you know well done to the committee and I think Pauline in particular who identified this during the visit and decided to push to raise it. I think Rona as well, mm -hmm. and it just shows that simply by asking questions and intervening we can make a bit of a difference. Um, the 
letter itself towards the end it talks about those uh, former prisoners who don't have a fixed address can't register with a GP so I wonder mm -hmm. what might be able to be done about that um, I'm sure it's not an easy fix but okay. it's certainly a significant matter that probably requires a bit of attention yeah. Yeah. Pauline back in the land um, yeah I, when I read that I thought these days to get an appointment with a GP within five days is really going to be challenging my, my concern would be if that's if that's rigid, then then some people are going to fall by the wayside. Yeah. Also depends as well what day they're they're, they're released and what system their GP has. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if there's some flexibility around the five days. Yeah. Jamie, uh, I wasn't going to comment, but uh, um, you know I'm dealing with a lot of casework at the moment of constituents who haven't been released to prison who don't have addiction issues and aren't prescribed methadone who are waiting three to four weeks mm -hmm. for a GP appointment. It's mm -hmm. really hard to see what happens when that five-day prescription runs out. Yeah. It's, that's the crunch point, it's not the day of release. So that, that plus five days point is when someone's in a state of you know, possibly quite, quite a, an, an emergency situation with regards to their, their medical issue. At that point, if they cannot be seen by someone and cannot get a prescription, where do they go? It's at that point, my fear is that they will revert back to illicit mm -hmm. um, drug taking mm -hmm. um, rather than the prescribed programme that they've been on whilst in custody. Um, I think we need more detail of that. I actually think that's a question for because it's an NHS run service and and as we know that these are no longer provided by the prison service, this this question has moved from justice to the health portfolio. And I think that's a question that the health secretary needs to respond to. Okay, thanks. Um, what they're saying is just on, following on from Jamie, is um once they get past that five days, if they can't get a GP appointment, what they're doing is presenting themselves at AE. Mm -hmm. And and that's putting additional pressure onto A and E. Mm -hmm. And I mean, given what we've what we've been hearing recently, is you know if if possible, don't unless it's an absolute urgent emergency, not to appear at A and E. Um, and obviously, you know, but again, and I, I do know as well from a recent inquiry that a casework that is that there is a resilience, a winter resilience from the health um, secretary saying that they, they are looking, they're sending out letters to all GPs to open up appropriate appointments again. Because mm -hmm. I'm getting I'm getting a lot of casework saying that they're not able to get GP appointments and that's not even people coming out of prisons. Yeah. Rona? Just, I mean, all of us are able to get a prescription online quickly or a pres repeat prescription with a phone call and things. Would there not be some sort of provision where it could be made um, for... Um, you know, released offenders um, to do that as well, because as you say, it's completely critical if they, you know, within five days and and then they're left high and dry. But 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 we don't have to do that. We can get a repeat prescription by by as I say, going online or or phoning. So I wonder why they would be excluded from doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I mean, I I, I was quite. Um, heartened to hear that it, it sounds as though in terms of the release process um, things seem to have improved however it's um, and as the wise group articulate in their letter th it's the difficulties out with prison gates that seem to be the challenge and as as, as you've all uh, articulated um, access to GP um, contact is a real issue um, I'm aware through contact with NHS Crampion and my constituency role that there is a real sort of endeavour to, um, I suppose, encourage the public, the general public, to embrace sort of new ways of working in terms of not necessarily always requiring to see a GP um, in relation to a, a concern, a health concern, and rather there are other options, nurse practitioners that. Uh, the public can um, can be uh, signposted to and, and, and can uh, access. So I, I wonder if, in the context of, of this issue, if that's something that might be considered um, in order that people that are vulnerable have a, a have, have addiction or, uh, and are on release from prison um, can uh, similarly be uh, signposted elsewhere uh, and 
on, on that note, um, as per the recommendation in the uh, paper, uh, I wonder if this is something that we again write back to NHS Scotland on just raising the uh, copying the letter, but also raising some of the concerns that we've discussed uh, this morning. And members, Do, perhaps with the small addition of keeping the Parliament's Health Committee abreast yeah. of what we're doing with respect yeah. to maybe something they wish to consider quickly in their their, their agenda. Yeah, absolutely, and perhaps also the um, Angela Constance, the Drugs Minister, Thank as you. well. So, members, are agreeable that we um, share this with the relevant committees. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so that completes our public uh, business for today. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 9th of November, when we'll continue taking evidence as part of our uh, pre-budget uh, scrutiny process. Uh, and we'll now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>